Good morning, the people on YouTube. Welcome to the session. Just a sound check uh, to see whether your sound is working. And uh, we will soon commence with the session. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Good morning, everybody. It's just a battle to get everybody into the room, but uh, we will start as soon as possible. Um, uh, that's a problem. <laughs> so the people on YouTube and Zoom, we will start as soon as possible. Right, they asked us for another five minutes. Apparently, there's congestion on the highway. So, uh, so we just need to, to bear with us, please, for another five minutes. Tuesday was okay. Wednesday was a punch match. It took me two hours. I have got the same story again today, where you can't get in because the bus is hit for us. I'm coming out here. It's becoming more than normal. Mm. It's a problem. So that's that's why we're here. Let's discuss this. <laughs> All right, I just saw a lot of people walking in there, so another five, so and then we will start. I 
All righty, ladies and gents, let's get the session going. Good morning again to everybody. Uh, great seeing all of you. There's a lot of people arriving still, and uh, but we're going to continue. It's important work we have to do, and that is to give recognition to all the, the sponsors of this event and the Transport Forum. Um, all right, so a little bit of housekeeping, restrooms. Those of you haven't been here yesterday, uh, you just walk out this door to your left, you'll see there's a little glass passage. It's just about three meters on next to this room. You'll find the, the restrooms just next door here. All right. Um, yeah, take note that we we live streaming this event to YouTube and Zoom. That's why you see all these cameras and cables. Uh, bear of us with all these cables. Uh, we prefer rather in certain instances running on cable rather than Wi-Fi and all this stuff because uh, when you have a power outage, then Wi-Fi is obviously not working. So then the cable keeps on working. So that's the reason for that. Um, and uh, the people on YouTube and Zoom, you're welcome at any time to uh, you know, talk to us um, by the chat room. Zoom can also, uh, YouTube can also text uh, questions which we will recognize in during the session. Um, yeah, then uh, outside in the area uh, lobby, there's uh, desks, the see the RTMS and JC auditors have got desks there. Welcome to visit them when we, we do a break and uh, go and see what goodies they have there for you. Um, ladies and gents, in terms of the transport forum, you you're obviously aware of the fact that we're all attending this uh, complimentary. All our events are complimentary. And um, all the uh, related content of the, the events are on the website uh, complimentary for download. And obviously, because of that, we, we need sponsors and associates to make this possible. And uh, we would like to give some recognition for these. Um, our event today, you will see, we're talking and we're proudly being hosted by Standard Bank, as you obviously might have noticed. The beautiful facilities, the catering, everything is done by Standard Bank hosting this event. And uh, yeah, so we're talking about promoting best practices and driving standards. And the, the key here is logical logistics. And uh, thanks to Kathy, she's the brainchild of this topic um, and always supporting the the transport forum and this event is very much in in support of the road transport management system as well so it's 23rd of february 2023 for the record um and i'm not going to stand and read through the entire program obviously we've seen the program but it's great we're going to have transnet people talking to us and then where the, where the tacky eats the tar now the operators and so on we're also looking forward to mark's presentation um going to tell us about reality and what's going on there alongside the road. Um, uh, Mark was also to my assistant when my caravan broke uh, about a year ago. I was in quite a bad situation on this entry there right at uh, at Howick and my family, we were in quite danger and, uh, and Mark and his team came and they rescued us. So Mark is going to talk to us about today 
about reality and safety on, on the N3. And uh, I've got Kathy Bell who's going to moderate our Q&A session this morning. And you'll see me not going to encourage questions and answers during presentations. That's why we have the Q&A sessions. Otherwise, we're going to take too long. Um, and uh, so the second part of the, the program, you'll see the, we're still talking to operators and service deliverers in, in the space, logical logistics. And then we'll have a Q&A at the end of the session as well. And important is then we'll also have lucky draws. So as you can see on the, on the chairs here at the front, we've got the electric walk uh, that we're going to do a draw on and also a nice um, padded note, notebook pad uh, bag uh, sponsored by C-Track. So you might be the lucky winner of one of those two prizes. So we will circulate the container. We can put your business cards in and later on during this, this event. All right. So let's give quick recognition to our sponsors and associates. The Transfer Forum is proudly associated by Alliance Bodies in the Industry. They represent their members. Remember, the Transfer Forum doesn't represent anybody. It's a communication platform. Uh, so you can't become a member of the Transfer Forum. You can become a participant but you can become a member of the professional bodies. And you can see some of them are here listed. And these, these are informal alliance with the Transport Forum. And uh, from now on, from this associates and the sponsors, you guys are welcome to interrupt me. Should you want to come and say a few words or online on Zoom, if you want to say a few words, you're welcome to interrupt me should you represent one of these organizations. So South African Association of Freight Hoards, we talk about SAF, you can see already, established in 1921, and uh, the National Association of Members throughout the Republic of South Africa, and they make a major contribution to facilitating trade within South Africa. So thank you, Saul, for your kind support. South African Express Parcel Association, they present the body of the voice of the express delivery industry in South Africa. We've got the South African, sorry, we've got the Road Freight Association, Gavin Kelly and team, representing the truckers, uh, very relevant for today's session as well. Thank you for your alliance. We've got African Rail Industry Association, Michelle and Slapo and team, very much involved in getting the industries to collaborate, private sector and public sector, and to make a logistical system work for us. Then we've got South African Bus Operators Association, also related to this event, also RTMS um, compliant people. And you can see they already formed in 1980. Basil Governor is doing great work with Saboa, representing bus and coach industry. And then we've got formal media alliances. Obviously, there are many uh, journalists in the sessions. And uh, the Strontford Forum, uh, next week, the Strontford Forum will be 16 years old. Uh, through the years, we had, we've been uh, blessed in having many journalists actually giving us great exposure. And that actually helped us a lot to be where we are today. Um, these media organizations are in formal agreement with the Transit Forum. And you can see we talk about Freight News, uh, also known as Freight and Trading Weekly before. Um, news and features for import, export, decision makers, all about logistics news. Um, if you're not subscribed to these magazines, you're obviously missing out big time. So we highly recommend that you subscribe to them. We've got Railways Africa magazine. Specialist trade, technical business to business online publication, and it's all about rail infrastructure. We've got Engineering News, part of the Crema Media Group, and uh, they <clears throat> usually send us a, a wrap up video of the week. So let's see what they've sent us. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Engineering News and Mining Weekly magazine, published on Friday, 24 February 2023. In this week's cover article, Engineering News and Mining Weekly Senior Deputy Editor Natasha Oudendahl writes that telecommunications companies are feeling the pressure of sustained levels of load shedding. As South Africa's persistent load shedding shows no signs of abating, the country's telecommunications companies are having to ramp up mitigation measures in an effort to keep consumers connected. The engineering news features focus on industrial and commercial lighting, where solar fittings illuminate load shedding shadows. 
and rubber products and recycling, where a partnership aims to benefit the rubber recycling industry. The Mining Weekly features focus on South Africa's mining outlook, where the foundation is being laid for a renewed interest in exploration. And Mining in Namibia, where uranium demand is growing on the back of the Paris Agreement. This week's business leader is Pule Motibe, the incoming CEO of Ensika Consulting. And as this week's cartoon shows, it's far from clear what good will come from the decision to declare South Africa's long-running electricity crisis a state of disaster. We hope you enjoyed this week's edition of Crema Media's Engineering News and Mining Weekly. Be sure to subscribe to the magazine that offers you in-depth news about developments in the real economy by emailing subscriptions at engineeringnews.co.za. Happy reading and see you next time. Right, thank you, Engineering News. Kathy, I don't know if you want to come and say a few words about Standard Bank, our host for today. Thank you, Harry. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It's always exciting to see all the familiar faces and some not. Um, but one thing's for sure today, what you can get from Standard Bank is great great innovative content. We've got some of the leading thoughts, mind leaders around best practice and about performance-based standards in the world, the entire world, in the room today. So I think that's quite exciting. Obviously, Standard Bank, we are very excited to partner with industry. And this is one way that we do that. It's not about product push. And I've got my colleagues in the room, Vikash and Annie and the team. They are, yes, if anybody wants to finance a big loco or a big PBS truck or a big 520 Volvo, we're in the room. We're here. We're able. We're capable. We are not scared of the industry. We are well prepared. So we look forward to a very exciting day. So yesterday, Isolo, we had the team from TPT and we went to the terminal. So we also are very excited about what they are proposing um, around changes. As you know, um, the rail and the ports and all those wonderful things are topical. We've got some exciting opportunities um, because challenges bring opportunities. Am I right? Of course, yes, absolutely. So we've got some great positive news. Um, and um, we also have the TPT team representatives here that are going to give us some insights. We've got some great speakers. We've got Young Stretchy from DOT, um, who will also tell us a little bit about um, another key stakeholder. So we've got industry, we've got stakeholders, we've got media, um, we've got some great thought leaders, and we've got those that have a lot to say, but actually don't say much, like moi. Um, but welcome today. Enjoy yourselves. Enjoy yourselves, and we, we're so keen, and we're going to have many more of these. But yeah, welcome um, and enjoy yourselves. And don't carry, as usual, um, this is quite exciting. And thank you, got a nice full room. Wonderful, thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much, Kathy. Besides uh, Standard Bank hosting this event uh, today, they're also a gold sponsor, <clears throat> excuse me, with the Transport Forum. I just want to mention, should you see a delay uh, between our lip sync and that we you see on the screen, the reason for that is what you see in the screen is what the people from Zoom outside see. Um, so you're looking at the Zoom screen there. Um, it's just to make it a little bit more collaborative. So when Zoom people present, we see it on the big screen as well. So uh, yeah, so that's why there's latency between, but don't worry, they what they see is, is in sync. Right, C-Track. C-Track is a leading global software as a service and big data company for vehicle tracking, fleet management, and insurance telematic solutions. Uh, Krista, can you come to the front? We want to say a few words. C-Track is a platinum sponsor of the Transport Forum, and they've actually been a founding member of the Transport Forum many years ago. Morning, everyone. I'm Krista from C-Track. And um, I'm a key accounts manager looking after our alliances and partners. Thank you, Kathy and Standard Bank for hosting us today. We are a proud sponsor of the Transport Forum. And um, we specialize in vehicle and transport telematics. I have a short video, which I want to show you, of our recently launched um, Crystal platform. It's a single sign-on platform, um, which makes your lives much easier. So it's not 10 logging details for 
um, your tracking of your vehicles or um, the camera system. It's a single sign-on platform and we will introduce it in a phased process. Thanks, Harry. You can show us the video. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. Let's have a look at the video. Maximizing fleet uptime, whether big or small, is a daunting and time-consuming task. Introducing Crystal, the all-new, innovative, and all-encompassing data platform from C-Train, saves you time and money, helping you to streamline your vehicle fleet and asset control. C-Track Crystal, configurable by you to your needs, means no more time-consuming and unnecessary dashboards and reports. Only clear and precise data in real time, in the cloud, and accessible from anywhere in the world on any device. Simplify your driver management, task deployment, and communication through proactive driver behavior monitoring to ensure safe driving less collisions, and in turn, reduced insurance costs and third-party claims. With the Crystal app, the power is in your hands. C-Track Crystal, your tool for a more productive fleet, more proactive decision-making, and ultimately, a better return on your fleet and asset investment. So whether you're on the beach in Bali, the sand dunes of the Sahara, or sunny South Africa, your fleet will always be safe, productive, and always visible. Great, thank you, C Track. JC Auditors, uh, Oliver, I don't know if you want to say a few words on, on JC Auditors. Also, a gold sponsor of the Transport Forum. Thank you very much, Harry, and good morning, everybody. Yeah, we're happy to partner with the Transport Forum. Essentially, um, our business offers a full house of certification solutions for the transport um, industry. Many of you know us as RTMS auditors, uh, building safety, compliance, and risk management into the trucks and, and bus industry. But we also offer other solutions. And as I was saying to someone over a cup of coffee this morning, our goal is actually to, to enable you as the transport sector to build in sustainability into what you do by managing your risk um, in, a, in an effective manner and to mitigate those risks. So we look forward to chatting to you. Um, we have a table outside. Uh, please pop in for a quick uh, chat and uh, grab some, some notepads and other marketing stuff we have out there. Thanks very much, Harry. Thank you, Oliver. Right, University of Johannesburg, ladies and gents, also been a founding member of the Transport Forum uh, for many years. They've got the Department of Transport and Supply Chain Management, Prof. Jackie Walters, Prof. Nolene Pisa, and them also mentoring myself quite a lot. We do planning together to actually make this Transport Forum work. Uh, and we also appreciate your feedback after events. After this event as well, you will receive an email requesting your feedback and also prompting you to advise on what topics you think we should address in future. And we obviously put it into a database and we, you know, it helps us a lot with the planning process. So thank you for that. Global Trade Solution, also a gold sponsor. You can see the consulting and strategy, software solutions, specialized services, all uh, imports and exports, very advanced technologies like blockchain and so on. So it's really, you know, advisable to talk to these people um, in terms of your strategy and transforming your global supply chain. Pegasus, um, like they say, they're changing lives and changing worlds, leverage our sector leading expertise and experience to craft and implement mobility solutions, which work and have substantial impact. Uh, Pegasus, gold sponsor of the Transport Forum, you can see they focus on cities, climate, energy, resilience, transport, waste, and water. So definitely organization to talk to. Unitron Supply Chain Solutions. Uh, there Carly Fenter is also presenting later on this morning. Carly, I don't know if you want to say a few words on Unitrons at the moment. Harry, just a big thank you for inviting us today and apologies for not being able to be there in person. 
Um, I look forward to engaging everybody later on today and listening to all the wonderful speakers and just hope it will be a fantastic day. And thank you to you and Kathy for organizing and hosting us all. Thank you, Carly. Appreciate it. Appreciate you need to answer support as a gold sponsor. Right, but Air Cargo fulfills the needs of the express cargo industry for daytime and overnight cargo capacity across comp a comprehensive southern and east africa footprint also gold sponsor interesting organization is ticket pro you might have experienced them before it's for your online corporate needs online booking systems um, you can see they say no hidden fees just good business with straightforward fair pricing for all your online booking it's an online corporate travel booking tool with everything you need and nothing you don't want <clears throat> Still from the same organization, they've got uh, Ticket Pro Smart Tap. The Smart Tap is a system which includes key features like comprehensive route management, flexible passenger payment methods, flexible route and fare product setup, shift and dispatch management, cashier system inspection tools, and comprehensive management information system reports. So thank you, Ticket Pro, for your gold sponsorships. Zutari. Zutari is consulting engineering of note, also a gold sponsor with the Transport Forum for many years. Um, thank you, Zutari, for your support, uh, previously known as Oricon. Kuba, organization focusing on automatic fare collection. They say they're transforming ticketing. Also, their solution is part of the ICA Mobility Group, journey planning, smart ticketing, streamlining electronic payments, shaping the digital transformation of the mobility sector. Thank you, Kuba. Easy Clear, software solutions for customs clearing, freight forwarding, and logistics providers covering air, sea, road, and rail. Thank you, Easy Clear. So as I said, we will have a lucky draw at the end of this event. There's the nice notebook uh, bag, C-Track, and we'll also have another prize, the electric box from the Transport Forum. So let's give the sponsors and alliances a big hand for making this possible. <laughs> All right, so Olga, there's Olga, she here. Uh, Olga, you want to come and talk about the business directly? <laughs> Ladies and gents, um, <clears throat> just want to introduce you to the business director of the Transport Forum. Um, it's like a yellow pages that you can get your company listed in the business directory, very well categorized. One of our B initiatives, we outsource this to Boleng Bontle Consultant. So here she is right in front of you. Morning, everybody. Um, I'm Olga Mashilo from Buleng Buntla Consultant, um, the business uh, directory administrator. With the business directory, it works just like the, with your telecom directory where you list your business uh, for the year at the cost of around 450 uh, per annum. And uh, you are able to have at least uh, up to 7,000, if not more, uh, tabs uh, with regard to people who would like to have an opportunity to work with you, being partnership or also looking for business or you yourself when you're looking for business uh, with other uh, companies. So for you to be able to um, list on our business directory, you just send me an, a WhatsApp message or you send me an email with your company details, and then we take it from there. Thank you. Well done, Olga. And there's Olga's number. You can take a picture of the screen. Uh, obviously, on the Transfer Forums website, you'll also find the contact details. Also, what we'll do in the email we're going to send you for feedback, you'll have an option there to indicate whether you want Olga to give you a call. So that we can also do for you. All right. There's a Transfer Forum website, ladies and gents, the presentations you, you see presented here today, as well as all the other presentations presented over the past 16 years more of 900 of them are available complimentary in the Transformers website for download. Um, what you do is you you, uh, you go to the, the events tab, the events menu on the Transformers website, and you select downloads 
and then you should be able to download. But before you do that, you log in. That's our way to, to get your information according to our Poppy Act, Poppy Act policy. And um, we keep you posted on our events and so on. So that's a trade-off. So you can get the, the content complimentary, but we can keep you up to date in terms of our events, which are complimentary as well. Um, all right, you need to log in. Should you not have a pass a, a, a account yet with the transport forum, you go to the user menu, you click on sign up, and you create your own complimentary account of the transport forum. And that sign up you create yourself, you can use that when you go to events, downloads, and you should be able to access this little simple search engine. You can see that there are two fields, two ways you can search. The top field, you can see they find by title or description. When you type in there, for example, Van Hastien, and you hit search, it will bring you all the presentations Van Hastien presented over the past 16 years. If you type in logistics, it'll bring up all the presentations with logistics in the title of the presentation or a person's surname and so on. The bottom one category, there you can select the day's date and it'll bring up all the presentations presented on that day. All right, so there's two ways you can you can access presentations. All right, so without further ado, I would like now to get to our program of the day and let's kick off the exciting day. Um, and uh, we're going to call on Mr. Chris Stretch from the bottom of the transport case it in, who's going to do the welcome for us. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Harry. <laughs> Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your day to attend something that's uh, really worthwhile and uh, really passionate about this RTMS and some of these programs. Um, it's also nice to have face-to-face -face, uh, dealings again. I know there are some people who have dialed in, but it's nice to see a uh, few people in the room for change. Get a bit lonely sometimes. Eh? <clears throat> the sad reality on our roads at the moment, every day there's another truck accident or some truck involved in some issue on either the N3, N2 or some of other roads. And um, enforcement can only help to a very small extent to, to alleviate these sort of problems. The biggest impact we can have is if industry takes more responsibility for what they're doing on the roads. And that's where RTMS and this sort of thing comes in. But um, what I want you to do today is you're going to hear some brilliant things about RTMS. But at the end of the day, I want you to take all, everything you've heard about RTMS, all the wonderful stuff, Put it one side and ask yourself one question. When your loved ones, your family, your kids are using the roads, which trucks do you want them surrounded by? RTMS uh, transporters or non-RTMS uh, transporters? So do, do yourself a favor, ask that question at the end of the day. It makes the decision whether to become RTMS accredited um, or not uh, a lot easier, I think. But uh, enjoy the day. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you for spending time with us today. We really appreciate your support. All right, so ladies and gents, our first formal presenter then is Mr. Nico Duplessis. He's the head of security transnet port terminals. He's going to talk about the driver truck management solution. Thank you very much, Nico. Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, it's actually quite a, a good and a opportunity that uh, was uh, offered to us by uh, the Transport Forum to actually present this uh, solution or the system that we've developed uh, over the last couple of years. Quite a bit of hiccups in the past uh, in terms of our implementation date and uh, all these things, but I think we're very close to, to go live with the solution. And that's why I think it's important that, uh, uh, especially the transporters who are dealing and doing business with us, especially in the container sector, because that's where we are focusing on for this uh, solution. Uh, for now, our pilot will be the Port of Durban, uh, and specifically then the three terminals where we handle containers, being uh, Pier 1, uh, Durban Container Terminal, as well as then the, the Point Terminal. Um, so what is the DTMS? Uh, with our implementation of our auto gates, those who are familiar with it, um, container terminals here in, in, in Durban, 
Uh, we started with the Autogate solution uh, at Pier 1 in 2007 uh, after the re-engineering of that uh, multi-purpose facility into a dedicated container terminal, as well as then in 2009 in uh, Durban Container Terminal. The identification and the linking of the truck driver uh, and wasn't a uh, critical control for the transaction to happen. So which means we then obviously didn't identify the truck driver uh, when it came to the terminal. And again, you know, over the years, uh, we haven't really had any container thefts. There was no issues. Uh, but then uh, in 2018, towards the end, beginning of 2019, we uh, started to see uh, trucks being cloned uh, and then uh, on our system, it all looks all good and well and fine. Uh, and then uh, we realized, but somebody else cloned the truck and came in and collected the, the, the container before the assigned transporter was actually able to come and um, collect the, the container, which then obviously means that not only TPT as a terminal operator uh, are exposed to the claims and stuff, but also because of the transport uh, company According to the system, it was released legally to, to the transporter. Uh, the claims are also then directed towards the transporter. So with the solution that we are implementing, uh, we are actually looking at having a three-way tie between the transporter assigned on Navis, our terminal operating system, um, and the truck that, uh, that, that belongs to the transporter, as well as in the truck driver, that the truck driver is indeed employed by that transporter so we will have the three-way tie uh, and then also um, link it up to our terminal operating system as well as where we have the uh, booking system in place for the collection of the containers it will also verify against the booking system that there's indeed a booking for this truck to come and collect the the container and hopefully through that ways and means we will then obviously uh mitigate the, the risk of the container thefts happening in our uh, space. Uh, also, over the years, because we didn't identify the truck driver, uh, when there's some misbehavior and uh, shenanigans uh, from the truck drivers in terms of non-compliance to our <clears throat> terms and conditions, whether it's uh, non-conformance to our PPE requirements or not following the uh, our uh, procedures in terms of where they need to stand or whatever else and stuff, then we would deregister the truck and not necessarily penalize the, the driver. So with this solution, uh, we are able now to deregister the, the employee uh, or the truck driver. So your truck can still be used by another uh, driver to come and collect containers. And it's not an inconvenience to the transporter that the truck uh, is deregistered and they can only um, after re-registering, come and use the truck again to, to do business with us. So uh, so while the transporter is dealing with his own disciplinary process in terms of the, the behavior of the uh, employee, the truck can still be used uh, for business and doing business with us. So just a quick snapshot of how we currently do it, the S, E's and the 2B. So obviously, um, the current verification is basically just uh, Verification of the truck, and we do a breathalyzer when the uh, truck driver uh, come to our first check just to make sure that he's not under the influence as per our policies. And then uh, we allow them to be processed through our autogate process, specifically for Pier 1 and, and Pier 2. Um, our 2B solution, more or less similar than uh, what you find a lot of times in the uh, bigger estates or uh, some office parks. Um, although we're not going to use uh, the um, for the for the driver verification, we're actually going to use facial recognition and not uh, any other biometric like a fingerprint or so. But we will definitely scan the the driver's license. Now, again, I know within the uh, industry, there's a lot of uh, foreign drivers that's also employed legally, working in the country, having the necessary permits. Uh, so those guys, especially the Zimbabwean driver's license is a little uh, metal plate, so it's not something that you can scan. So we will obviously then issue those drivers with a uh, QR code ID card, uh, which we then obviously link the, 
the biometrics uh, to that specific card as well, uh, similar to any other ID card uh, that is issued to, to people. Um, okay, so this is just at the high level how these things will work. So uh, the blue is obviously the trucking company, what the trucking company uh, will do and how they will manage their portion of the system. Uh, the green is what uh, TPT will manage from our side, uh, transit port terminals, and then there's a dual uh, functionality where either the trucking company or TPT can manage um, the, the profile on the system. So there will obviously be a link to, uh, for a trucking company to register. So you first register your company. Uh, and again, I think, uh, but I will get to that in terms of our way forward. Uh, and then after you've registered your company, you will register all your trucks that, that's doing business with a port um, or with our facilities. Uh, and again, for now, it's basically the, the trucks uh, coming to the port of Durban, uh, like I said, coming to collect containers. Then obviously, you will also register all your drivers that's in your employee. Uh, TPT will then obviously verify the truck uh, details uh, through our interface with uh, eNatus. And then uh, we will obviously then uh, approve that application in terms of the registration. Uh, the, the trucking company can then obviously manage their profile on the system. So uh, if your truck is involved in an accident, written off, uh, your truck driver is uh, dismissed for poor behavior, all these things, you can go into the system and deactivate a truck, deactivate a RFID card, where we are using the RFID cards with the auto gates. Um, and then obviously between TPT and uh, uh, the trucking company, uh, we will manage the truck profiles and the driver profiles. Uh, we will obviously on uh, the visit to the to our facilities, to the container facilities, we will verify the driver. And like I said, verify that the driver is actually in the employee of the company that was appointed to come and uh, deliver or to collect the, the containers. Uh, from the transport company point of view, you will obviously manage your user access for your company. Uh, you can also manage your trips. Um, should, should it happen that there's some delays, maybe uh, there's a uh, system down or there's the terminal is windbound and uh, there's a bit of staging time in our staging area, and you need to swap uh, truck drivers. I mean, uh, maybe somebody needs to take a rest or whatever the case might be. Uh, you are able to then obviously manage those trips uh, on, on the system as well. And we will obviously then register the biometrics of the, the truck driver. Like I said, uh, the biometric that we chose after COVID was obviously facial recognition. Uh, the components uh, of the applications, Obviously, web browser uh, on the top uh, where the driver and truck management system uh, is in the main source. We will interface, uh, like I said, in the middle with the uh, port management system, although that uh, did fall a bit by the wayside after the transit cyber attack where the integrated port management system got a bullet through the heart and was killed uh, as, as part of the cyber attack. However, I believe uh, the system is up and running again, or they awarded the contract for the resuscitation of that uh, system, updating it. So once that is up and running, uh, we obviously want to try and see how we can interface with, with that system, uh, making it easier for the transporters. Uh, once you have registered uh, on the IPMS, on the integrated port management system, in terms of the harbor carrier permit and these things, you are easy then to... Uh, pull that data through to the DTMS to also help with the verification and validation of uh, the, the, the transport company. Uh, then uh, on the internal side, like I said, we will um, interface with the appointment system where it's in, it's in place to make sure that uh, the truck that's actually indeed in front of us does have an appointment uh, to also again make sure that there's no unannounced um, visit by some criminal elements that come and try and steal the containers. And then uh, obviously the interface with our terminal operating system being Navis, uh, because currently it's only on the container sector. However, if this is successful, we will roll it out to the other uh, 
terminals as well, where we operate our GCOS system, the general cargo operating system. Uh, and then obviously on the business intelligence side, just in terms of managing uh, statistics and, and all these things and stuff. So uh, like I said, there's also interface with Inatus, uh, as well as the people, national people register at home affairs, just to make sure that there's no dead person being registered uh, also as part of the criminal activities to try and uh, steal uh, containers and stuff. So, um, Benefits of the DTMA solution, I think we've already touched on it during the presentation, is obviously the er eradication or at least the reduction of container thefts, the traceability of the driver involved in any container theft. Uh, if the driver is not linked to the haulier or the DTMS uh, on the DTMS system, uh, access will obviously be den denied. Uh, transport companies are able to manage their profile online to remove drivers no longer in their employ uh, to prevent any unauthorized access. Uh, South African drivers will be identified by means of their driver's license, uh, being able to scan that 2D barcode on the back of the driver's license. And we will issue foreign drivers with a, uh, I said the 2D barcode, but it's actually a QR code ID. Uh, and then obviously, uh, the, it will also assist us in the early identification of potentially cloned trucks, because we are we have the truck details and we scan the, the license, it says it's a Volvo truck and there's a and the and the license is on a Mercedes Benz, then hopefully we will be able to uh, to, to say something is wrong, then the bells must ring. So yeah, uh, traceability of the trucking company involved in container thefts through the system link between the driver and the trucking company, and the truck and the trucking company. Um, although uh, I must say I cannot say that to date that we actually say oh this is the transporter that's involved because the, like I said normally the the transporter that we've got on the system, that's a clone truck and the truck is not necessarily uh, belonging to the transporter uh, that's actually assigned to come and pick up the container. So I'm not saying we, we're dealing with a lot of criminals in the transport sector with our business. So the, the criminals are exploiting the process at the moment. So, so then obviously a, a reduction in claims for both TPT and the transporters, as well as the satisfied customers, because we are able to, uh, to protect the cargo whilst in uh, the care and custody of both TPT and hopefully the transporter as well. Our way forward, uh, the intention is to start looking at uh, uh, re our registration process for the truck trucking companies to start with the registration process from the, I said the 1st of April, but those who are uh, all awake and uh, know the dates, uh, 1st of April is a Saturday. So hopefully come the 3rd of April, you say, hey, that was an April's Fool's joke. Uh, you you haven't started on the 1st of April. So so hopefully in the first week or so of uh, April, we will obviously uh, switch on the system. Uh, if all, all systems are going to, to be able to start with the registration process, there will uh, be a link on our uh, website. Uh, as well as then obviously there's uh, other ways by emails, our call center and all these things with our known uh, transporters. We will then obviously um, also provide them with a link to be able to, to start registering their companies and stuff. So we will also from our side uh, avail resources to assist with the registration of companies where uh, companies feel that uh, they, they're quite big and they've got, rather than having now a dedicated resource from their side, um, I we will avail some of our security personnel that we've got that we've trained to also then assist with the uh, registration of the companies and the uploading of the truck details and uh, and the drivers. Uh, we also will have a twenty four seven help desk uh, and uh, registration offices available, uh, specifically here in Durban. Uh, we are also looking at maybe for the uh, Gauteng based companies uh, if they want to uh, do. Uh, some uh, registration already of the truck drivers uh, in Johannesburg. Uh, we're looking at setting up office in City Deep. We're just waiting for confirmation from our colleagues at uh, Freight Rail to say they've got a, a space for us available to to set up that uh, help desk there. And then, like I said, because it's a, a a pilot for Durban, if there is any Cape Town-based companies that do long haul between uh, Cape Town and and Durban, if there is a need. Uh, we also have 
some resources from our software developer available in Cape Town that can assist with uh, any registration in Cape Town that, that might be required for now. Uh, so obviously our initial uh, take is to target our top city transport companies because we feel if we target those, we will bas basically achieve almost like 80% registration of the current trucks that's on our terminal operating system on Navis. And then uh, we can start looking at uh, switching on the verification uh, as side or the leg of the of the solution. And I think that's about, my, I think my time is up and that's the end of my slide. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Nico. Uh, Clearly a very complex environment you guys are working in and we appreciate you sharing and we are looking forward to the 1st of April. All right. Back to our program, ladies and gents, also from from um, from Transnet, but also the chairman of the Durban Con Chamber Port Forum. It's Mr. Willi here, and he's going to talk to us about port logistics chain road transport. Thank you very much, Willy, for all your support to the Toronto Forum as well. Thanks, Ari. Um, yeah, with Nico, I'm the other big white oak at Transnet. <laughs> so he's the tight head prop and I'm the lose it. <laughs> and Ari can be our hooker, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, apart from my day job at Transnet, um, I'm also the chair of the Durban um, Port Forum. Uh, we, uh, I think from, and, and, and we gate crashing this event, thanks, Kathy, to, <laughs> to, to market and, and talk about the, the, the Durban Port Forum. We're supposed to have our um, meeting around the forum. And as part of what we do is we're trying to look at the different aspects around the port and see how can we improve the fluidity in the port. And obviously, the trucking side of it is very, uh, very important for what's happening in the port. There's about 4,000 port calls um, of trucks on a daily basis in, um, in Durban. And the challenges are, how do you deal with that? How do you improve the, the, the throughput and the turnaround? So I've got a couple of guys from the chamber and from our committee um, in the audience. There's a couple of online as well. I just want to acknowledge Barry at, at the back there. Just put up your hand. If anybody wants to talk about the uh, membership and talk about the top future forums, Barry is the, the person to talk to. Um, Caroline, you've been quite involved <laughs> um, in our trade and investment forum in the past and also quite active in, in this forum. And then I'm going to introduce Yolan quickly to you. Um, and just to talk about... <laughs> But being a business forum in this day and age, because I think Teams and Zoom has changed the way that we interact with each other. Um, Chris spoke about being able to see people face to face and how nice it is. I think um, running a, a forum like this, you need to, to add benefits. And in the past, it was easy. People come to the forum to learn things that they haven't, um, that, 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 that they don't, they can't get anywhere else or they share information and they talk. But now there's so many interactive places to, to, to do these things. So we've changed our format um, in terms of just having monthly feedback meetings. Every month we had stats and people had long lists of, um, of graphs and things, and people fall asleep if you, if you try to do that in your, in your meetings. So we um, doing what we're doing today. We, we're interacting, um, getting involved in other ways to communicate about um, issues. I think this chap from CSIR 
I don't see him now. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, research is so important and, and sharing that sort of research on a platform like this. So going forward, that's the sort of things that we would engage with. Um, we've got a dashboard that I'm going to talk to a, a little bit um, in cooperation with the South African Association of Freight Forwarders giving a, a picture of what's happening in a port. Nico spoke about a port management system. That's basically what we need for all our ports in, in South Africa. Um, we touch on the both strike recovery, the stuff that we did as a, a, a chamber um, towards the transit strike, um, things like block evacuation of containers. And then lastly, there's uh, evacuation of abnormal cargo. Now, Chris um, was here already, but I'm going to call him back <laughs> quickly to just talk about that one and the things that we did as a, as a chamber to, to look at how do we deal with the congestion in the port. So firstly, from a port forum, that's basically what I, what I spoke about. We've, um, our job is to, act, to, to um, promote advocacy. Now, Yolen is our, I see you guys are color matched <laughs> in shirts. Yolen, Yolen is our, um, the, the guy at the chamber responsible for advocacy. So I'm just going to call on you quickly to just do a little bit of, of what is it that you do as an advocate? Thanks, Vuli. I'm not an advocate by profession. <laughs> Um, so the Durban Chamber is an organized body uh, representing various economic sectors um, across Durban and also on, on a national scale. So part of what we do is uh, look at uh, policy legislation and also issues that are affecting industry on a regular basis. And be it, uh, if it's in the transport or logistics sector, it uh, more speaks to the Durban Port Forum and uh, the Economic Affairs and Trade and Investment uh, Forum. So th this is one of the many um, structures that we have at the Durban Chamber. Um, it spans right into manufacturing. It focuses on four different regions, the western, southern, northern, and the central area. Um, so I encourage you, if you want to be a part of these sessions, um, it's, it's incredible. And we'll also appreciate your expertise in contributing to some of the solutions that we're continuously working towards. Thank you so much. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Yolen. Uh, he's, not, he's normally a shy guy, he doesn't. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, as, as a chamber, you, you got guys pay membership to the chamber. So what do you get for that? And what do you get that you can't get somewhere else? And I think advocacy is one of the, the main things. Um, we just dealt with the issue this morning with um, one of the curing and forwarding guys. And I think we saved them about 18 million in just because we intervened and we did um, open some doors as the chamber. Um, the collaboration of industry bodies, there's a whole lot of other industry bodies in the ports, specifically SOSOA, the ship owners and agents, um, SAF, the freight, forwarder, freight forwarders, and then you guys, the trucking fraternity. So there's a whole lot of different groupings of, of, of trucking um, companies. There's harbor carriers, there's uh, Road Freight Association, Gavin Caddy's people, there's um, a couple of new guys. Um, so, so I think we're trying to say, how can we interact better? What can we do in a different way, especially around the trucking situation? So today is one of the ways to see what are the issues that's out there and what are the places where can we get involved to, to broker the um, the throughput through the port. How can you make your lives easier? Um, and then, yeah, engagement around the port and, and etc. So let me just start with the dashboard. I think everybody's got a need to see um, what's happening in this black hole. Everybody's got the C track systems. They got they know when their truck is where. What's happening to that? But once the truck goes into the port and things gets offloaded what happens then so we've been working with SAF around a dashboard to give us a a, a one-stop view of what's happening around the port um, so your Dr. Yonita Maria and um, her people have been very active in putting this together there's a company called Crickmay that provides some of the um, information for this um, so starting on this side, we start by looking at what's happening out at sea. The guys at Stainham Schlanger, they 
for them it's easier. They can <laughs> can just look and see where are the ships. And then there's a vessel tracking um, system. You can go on your phone, you can check, okay, that ship out there, that's a container ship waiting to get into the port. Um, or that ship over there is whatever. Um, in terms of vessels at Anchorage, um, there's currently only one container ship waiting to go into, into Durban of the 22, I think it's, <laughs> it's out at Anchorage. Um, by the way, if ships wait for various reasons. It's not always that they wait for the port. Um, some wait for crew changes, some wait for other ships to come and drop off cargo, some wait for whatever. Um, sometimes it's just cheaper to hang there and wait for another job than to, to, to just um, to be at, out at sea. Um, then they look at, around the, the number of moves across the quay. So we're supposed to do, you know, on a good day, 6,000 moves is, is a good day in the container terminal where you take um, on the ship, uh, the guys were, were yes, yesterday, um, we did a port tour for the, for the delegates um, and we took them through the, what's happening in the port. And I know Harry, I'm going to run out of time if I go into all the details. But the, the, just the operation is just a, a massive thing if you, if you get close. So maybe in future we can do this for, for this type of forum um, as well. Um, 6,000 moves on a good day, 5,000 is the right. Um, vessels at birth, there's eight berths, container berths, all eight of them are full. Um, 17 cranes operating, so that's um, uh, pretty good. There's always one or two that's out for um, for service. Um, the, okay, so that's a, the, the water side of it. Then in terms of the port, we're looking at the, what's happening inside the port. 6.6 um, thousand containers currently in stack, 52% occupancy, et cetera. So you get the idea. There's this dashboard um, and the intention is to make it available for everybody in future. So you can drop down on these things. Um, I think for staff members at this stage, it's free. Uh, this probably might be, uh, and we're not there yet with the with SAF around the, the, the access to this in future. But this is what we're working on. And then on the trucking side, obviously, the staging times out there. And if you're not happy about the stats, you can drill down onto that and you can see, okay, there's red areas down Bay Edge Road, for example. And you can, this was, um, I think, Sunday. I, the, that I um, pulled this off the system. Um, anyway, so this is the system, and the, in future we'll make it available um, to to members. Um, in terms of the strike recovery, Transnet had a a very interesting year, <laughs> as you know. Um, the after the looting, we had storms. The um, we had fires in Richards Bay. We thought all sorts of issues. Um, we had a strike that that we had to to deal with. As the chamber, we got involved. We went um, to the shipping lines and we said, "Listen, is there a way before the strike to try and 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 prevent the strike from happening?" Um, and then we went with the shipping lines to Transnet and said, "Okay, here's a possible solution. Let's look at at, at brokering that." Unfortunately, we weren't able to to get a solution, so the strike did happen. But I think the good news is that after the strike, um, the process recovered pretty quickly. The last time the previous strike was in 2010. It took, um, I think, about seven months for all the backlog to be cleared and everything to be back on track. This time around, it was within three months, everything was back to normal. If you look at the projected figures for TPT, transit port terminals, in terms of um, automotives, we're going to do a, a record here this year. The aim is to get to 827,000 containers. Um, of that, about 600,000 is coming through through Durban, 550. Um, on the container side, just over 4 million containers, um, which is, I think, pretty much on track for where we're supposed to be at the end of the year. In terms of brake bulk, record years, 27 million tons of brake bulk. A lot of that has to do with um, the Richards Bay and the railway line <coughs> that um, had washed away. And some of the um, coal specifically is, going to, is, is getting pushed through on these um, tipper trucks that we spoke about yesterday. And then on the bulk side, um, a little bit down on, on, on the targets, 
but still not a not a bad year overall. So after the strike, we um, met again with Transnet, and we had some of the members of the uh, of the chamber, um, Sappy, Mr. Price, um, Toyota. A couple of these guys came to us and said, "Listen, how do we make sure that we recover as quickly as possible? What are the things that we can can put in place?" <laughs> so we sat down and we said, okay, things like priority evacuations, can we do bulk runs for these guys? Because you can't get a production line standing. And um, we were able to, to broker a, a solution that was different to, um, to what was done prior. And we got a, a, um, an agreement to say, okay, on request, let's look at ways to evacuate um, a block to, um, to a group of, of truckers that can work together. And that's why I spoke earlier about maybe looking at, at um, getting groups of people, um, CIL, PFS, um, harbor carriers, different groupings together. So this solution is currently even after the strike in place, where if by prior arrangement, block evacuations can be arranged through the turbine container terminal. And then lastly, around the evacuation of abnormal cargo, and there I'm on, <laughs> on <laughs> closing, um, we had a, 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 Chris, a huge um, jump in, in the number of um, abnormals that was coming through the Durban car terminal um, around November, December. I think prior to the agri uh, season, agricultural season, um, these it just spiked. And um, through uh, collaboration with, with Chris and um, the Department of Transport, um, uh, Sean, um, Sean from your office that issuing the permits got involved. Um, the Metro Police, we dealt with um, pulling the Metro guys into the meetings and we said, okay, how can we, how can we broker the, the speeding up the, the throughput of oversized cargo? I don't know. Chris, if you just want to do it now or with the question and answer session, but just want to talk a little bit about how the system works and, and what you guys put in place. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, for normal loads, what you normally do in a, a load comes to the harbor, you drive through to Maritzburg, get your permit, come back, and it's quite a sort of lengthy process and coming from outside the province as well. Um, we had a huge, uh, two main, main issues, obviously, is a uh, huge backlog in the port. And also, we're trying to level the playing fields because there's a lot of fly-by-nights out there who undercut, they underdeclared their weights and size in that. So they can pay less permit fees. They don't need RTI or, or traffic escorts in that. So to level the playing fields, we um, insist that all abnormal loads are weighed before they leave the port to protect our road network and protect all of you out there. So obviously, we, we didn't want to impose something on, on industry that would make it more cumbersome. So we've got a private company to go in there and put a waste slot in there. Um, if you a normal abnormal load might take almost two days to get your permits and everything sorted out. You know, you'd have to get your vehicle weighed somewhere, go and fetch your permits and all of that. So this waste slot in the port now. You drive over there, they'll check your size in, check your weights. We've got a link to the permit office, and they can actually print your permit um, at your vehicle or at, at the wayside. There are four different companies that can do it. Obviously, we don't want to force everyone to use one company. But so taking the, the permit time around from, say, two days to it can be about 20, 20 minutes now, you've got your permit, you can, can exit the port. Sean Sweet, good. Okay, so I think that is it for me as well. I'm just trying to say things are looking up. Things are looking up in, <laughs> in the ports and around the, the Durban Port Forum. I think we are really making a difference and creating an impact. Um, for our members. So even around Transnet, I know this just a closing, <laughs> there's a, um, a narrative to say you guys are um, a next Eskom or things are not looking good or whatever, the World Bank report and all that. Um, I think to the contrary, if things are really looking up. We are busy. We spoke yesterday about the private sector participation, bringing in partners and bringing in more role players into the system. And things are definitely not as bad as as people might be saying about the about Transnet. Um, so from the Durban Port Forum, thank you very much. Thanks for listening and enjoy your time.
Thank you so much, Vali. Can I say Vali and team? Um, clearly, a lot of work been done in the ports and around the ports. And from DOT side, we appreciate collaboration between Transnet and DOT and the trucking companies. And we privilege in being involved in getting the communication going. And we're looking up, Vali. Thank you very much. I'll just stand here, Kathy. One of the people can't hear you. Harry, something unexpected, unplanned, which we have to be able to adapt or change. A sleeve of some golf balls from Zolibix. Can ask a question. Okay. Who just presented? First, hand up. No man. Hi. There was a hand here. There's a hand there. Lady there. Well, you could say, good, you get a ball, Steve, of golf sports. I hope you play golf. <laughs> oh. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Harry. Just something about a bit of fun. Thank you. A lot of fun. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> All right. Let me just get my, my act sorted after that fun. All right, ladies and gents, we've seen now the tacky eating the tar on the ports, and now we're going to listen to the tacky eating the tar on the N3 and our highways. Um, so we're going to have Mr. Mark, Mark, I'm not sure about the pronunciation, it's Ramna Rayan, Ramna Rayan, uh, and he's going to talk to us about reality and safety on the N3. He's the chief executive officer of Mr. Towing. Now, he asked me to play a video quickly, and then he's going to present. And while he's presenting, he asked me just to put up slides about his company. He said he doesn't want to do company uh, you know, promotions, but uh, I'll show his slides when he talks. But what he's going to talk is not related to the slides you're going to see, something like that. So, Mark, thank you very much. We're going to have a look at Mark's video, and then Mark will take over. Priority is safety, safety of the scene, safety of the patients, uh, make sure the injured are treated. Uh, the necessary done for them, make sure the road is safe for other users to pass uh, before we remove the vehicle or do any other extrications or whatever. Most of our vehicles are wrapped with uh, cartoon characters, Mickey Mouse, Frozen, Transformers. That uh, brings the child down to a different uh, perspective where the child has from crying automatically starts seeing things that they would like to see and enjoy from a scene where it was all before them. Uh, we also used to do a teddy bear run whereby give the kids teddy bears and we, our vehicles are equipped with uh, water bottles so for water for the kids with little cartoon characters so that they can relax a bit because it's very traumatizing. For an adult, it is so traumatizing. The kid is 10 times more. The biggest, biggest thing that I've come across is texting and driving. And 90% of our accidents as well is alcohol in forest. Well, I've got my younger brother who's paralyzed from a car accident, and I do know that the guy that knocked into them was under the influence. That's why he ran away from the scene. That's personal. But I've seen many other kids hurt and injured because of drunk drivers. We had a recent incident where a guy came across the freeway at Tweedy and he'd head on to a family where the mother, father had just was deceased on scene. The young kid, she had broken both the femurs. She was trapped in the car with nobody. I would say, please, guys, stay away from drinking and driving. Yes, we do need the work, but we have kids, we have families. We wouldn't like it to be one of ours. So stay away from that. Stay away from texting and driving because one second will cost you your whole life. Uh, morning, everybody. My name is Mark Ramnarain from Mr. Towing and Recovery. Uh, we're based in the Midlands in Hawick and KZN. Uh, thank you, Harry and team, uh, for allowing us to present here today. 
uh, my topic today will be about reality and safety, road safety on the N3. Uh, most of you all know it's high risk to be on the N3 or any other road these days. Uh, the, the importance of understanding uh, an accident scene, a breakdown, protocols to follow, um, safety of the scene, safety of the injured, safety of other road users. Uh, that's where we get what you call RUMS. RUMS is um, Road Incident Management. It was implemented in 1997 by the Talcon, which is now called the N3TC. Um, you guys can Google that. Uh, it's a nice thing to understand. It's really important to, for the road user to know and understand it. Um, on scene, for rooms, we have what you call an FCP. FCP is a forward control point. A forward control point is where all the role players on scene meet um, together, which is your traffic department, your police, your SAP, your tow truck operators uh, who respond to these scenes. Uh, it's a place with, on the scene which is set up uh, where emergency communication uh, point. Uh, to reduce further delays, assure safety, efficiency on the scene. Um, the other thing is importance of reflective jackets, high visibilities, uh, so you can be identified on the scene. Um, the main concern that we have is motorists need to understand the importance of obeying a blue light, a red light, or an orange light as well. Um, slow down, move over, give them space. Uh, it gives us quicker time to respond, uh, response time to save lives, to assist people who are injured, um, remove wreckages. Um, the emergency lane, you need to stay away from it. Uh, it's meant for the, the traffic department. It's meant for the fire department, the ambulances, EMRS. Um, Every second counts, uh, not only the people on scene, uh, for the people who are traveling, your elderly who are sick, your kids, your people who need medical attention. Um, so if you give us the space, we can work uh, more pro uh, proficiently. Um, bystanders, bystanders create a big problem on the N3. Um, it becomes a problem for emergency, emergency personnel to work. Uh, we plead to the motorists to give them space to work for the safety or for their own self as well. As as you know, many of you may uh, have heard of the incident, the major incident in Boxburg, where the tanker exploded, killing many people um, and injuring dozens of bystanders. So stay away from the scene for your own safety. Uh, motorists, we'd like to say motorists and travelers, Carry a bit of water in your vehicles, a uh, little snack just in case you're stuck on the road. Make sure your phones are charged. Uh, check your vehicle regularly, uh, your safety equipment in the vehicle that you need. Um, another major, major problem that we have on the, on the roads is looting from an accident scene. You know, it, it's crazy out there. Um, so what we suggest is the truck drivers or the truck owners should have a plan in, in, in ready for when something, when an accident happens or an incident happens for them. And just basic points like have the route that you're traveling, you should know where your trucks are traveling. So you'll have the police numbers for those people, for the area. You'd have a security company that you can deal with because the, the, the police and stuff can't handle every scene. So you need the security company's backup you need a towing company that's affiliated, like us, to assist you efficiently, uh, get to the scene, secure the scene, able to give you feedback, photos, whatever you require. Um, also, you got to know what you're carrying, what you're transporting, whether it's hazardous, not hazardous, because of safety reasons. Thank you, guys. Thank you for the Transport Forum and Standard Bank for allowing me to present you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, much appreciated. And uh, 
I'm, I'm testifying of their good services in saving myself and my, my family from the entry. So thank you very much, Mark. That was great. And uh, clearly they know what they're talking about. And the trucks you see there, he actually designed those trucks and manufactured them himself, all the hydraulics and so on. So Mark, very impressive work you guys are doing. Thank you very much. Ladies and gents, let me get the program up. As far as I remember, we're now going to do a little bit questions and answers. And we have uh, young Kathy who's going to moderate for us. Kathy, yeah. Here. I think what we're going to do is um, we're going to have our presenters to sit here on these chairs here, and they will take up questions. And uh, and then as we go along, um, you know, they can stand up from there when they answer the question and so on. So, Jan, if you can get that camera on those chairs so long, and then we can see what we can do. Yes, ma'am. So we're going, to, we're going to do the questions and answers now moderated by yourself as per program. Thank you very much. And we ask, I asked the, the presenters of this morning to go and sit there. We can bring more chairs that side. Okay, yeah, I'm bringing you the mic so that everybody can nicely hear you. Thank you, Harry. So I think let us be um, consistent. We're going to work um, forward, backwards. Right. So um, any questions for young Mark over here? A few words. Any questions? There we go. There's old young Mr. Hughes. I shall bring you the mic. Okay, no worries. No, no, you got it? It's like an online thing. Thank you, Mark. Uh, my name is Ted Hughes from Hugh Court Trucking. And one remark you said about having the police on standby, well, police numbers, etc. absolute waste of time. We see them every day on the trucking sites, trucks being looted, the police keep the tra traffic running nicely so the looters don't get hurt while they're looting. So uh, SFPS on uh, looting of trucks, absolute waste of time. So trucking companies, of, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, towing companies, yes, of course. It's always good to be prepared, but uh, police, unfortunately, no. Mark, do you want to respond to that or just want to nod? Uh, I fully understand where you're coming from. We've seen it in many videos mm -hmm. on the social media platform. We find uh, all these videos circulating. Um, that's why my second one was the security companies. If you have a, a reliable security company in place, you will have no problems. Thank you. Right here, there's another hand in the back there. Okay, Olga, ask your question, please. Uh, my question to Mark and also to Nico. Uh, Nico, how would you, uh, as Transnet, ensure that the, uh, the trucks that have been cloned or the truck drivers, because uh, with the Zim uh, uh, truck drivers, some of them are using fake uh, driver's license, and they, most of our companies are not picking that up. The South African companies, they're not picking that up because they think it's an international uh, license, and they just hire them. So as a result, that's why we're always having these challenges at the ports whereby trucks are cloned, loads are stolen, and uh, those that stole loads, they steal them through the brokers. Uh, how do you deal with the brokers through your systems? And uh, to Mark, I would say I appreciate the fact uh, that uh, you included the security companies uh, in case of emergencies, because uh, during the emergencies for people to steal on the trucks while waiting for the police, uh, we need uh, companies like uh, Nova Galaxy um, who are able to set out uh, to send uh, the uh, drones to the uh, uh, incident and are able to pick up within seven minutes of uh, uh, the incident. So maybe you should, uh, I would advise that you get their systems also on your app, uh, on your phones as an app on the Play Stores. Okie dokie, that I think was good. Thanks, Olga, for that feedback. 
So I think what we'll do, we'll let young Nico answer the more difficult question. Thank you. Uh, in terms of uh, the verification of the foreign drivers, I know it is a challenge. I mean, uh, but again, uh, we're not immigration or uh, home affairs to make sure that uh, the employer employs somebody that's legally in the country. So, uh, however, uh, we did get, receive some training from our uh, home affairs officials in terms of identification of work permits and these things that we will do before we uh, register the, the truck driver onto the system. Uh, but again, uh, the, the cloned falsified uh, foreign driver license, it's a very difficult one to, to actually enforce from our side. So thanks. Thank you. All righty. And then you heard your question about um, Argo suggesting also drones and other alternatives. Yes. Thank Please you. For, thank you for that input. Uh, okay. So it was a thanks. All right. And there's another question over there. You can. Hi there, uh, Nick Yateman from Hugh Transport. Um, I just wanted to bring you guys from the port. I know you guys are trying to improve security, get all of that up to date, which I fully appreciate. Um, the problem there that we've encountered certainly, and I don't believe we're alone, is the attitude of the security staff there. Um, one of which is they make things exceedingly difficult. I've had RFID cards that have been taken from drivers then when I approach them about it, they say they never got it. We've had trucks turned away as a result. Um, the other thing was, which I don't know if you guys are aware, and I don't know why this happens, is that if you contravene something, if they deem it to be contravention, you then have to write a letter of apology and apologize to whoever that is at the security office. Now, I don't know who he thinks he is, but yeah, that's not going to happen. Um, so I think the one thing which I would like you guys perhaps to try and address is the attitude of the security staff there. The, we try to be as compliant as possible. We try and do everything that's mandated. And then the way that the transporters are treated at the port is as if you are criminals, even though you are running a reputable operation. Thanks, Nick. I mean, we can always uh, discuss this further offline. Uh, however, I'm also part of the Durban Container Terminal Security Group. And I must tell you, some of these truck drivers do behave like hooligans. Uh, so before we deregister the truck, uh, there's enough evidence to uh, support the decision to deregister the truck. But like I say, with the DTMS solution, we will no longer penalize and deregister the truck, but we will rather uh, revoke the access of the truck driver until such time that the employer has actually dealt with the uh, unruly behavior of the of the driver and stuff which means be, before you can do that we need to provide you with some sort of uh, evidence in terms of why we are doing it so because we also realize that uh, by penalizing you as a as an owner of the of the, uh, the trucking company by deregistering the truck it's not conducive to good uh, relationships and stuff so that's why we uh, rather than uh, through the DTMS uh, targeting the, the driver and his uh, bad behavior and stuff. So thanks. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Um, so can I suggest that any further engagement is directly with Nico? You're going to be there for the day, Nick? Yeah. Okay. So just make sure when we leave, yeah, we all stand. And I'm just teasing. So many years. I think maybe just after we're done, we're back for the comfort break, then you can have some more engagement. I think it'll be good. I think it's well aired, well ventilated, good understanding. Thanks for the response. Thanks for the questions. I think it's important. Um, and then I think we have got one more question or we're closing out. There's a hand right at the back there. Okay, one more question and then we close out. And then we... And we grab <laughs> Kathy, yes, there are two questions, this one and that one. We can, we can take it. Hi, it's Pragasan from Wardens. I just need to understand uh, what contingency plans uh, are the panel in terms of 20th March, 2023, the alleged national shutdown. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, well, I 
have a, a question for each of the panelists or the three besides Standard Bank. Uh, well, <laughs> well, uh, Mark, uh, we, we are engaging in a traffic safety program where we are trying to design safety systems in terms of uh, livestock safety, how it interacts with our mobility infrastructure. And I would like to ask in your own experience, especially in your area around Howick, how regularly do you encounter traffic incidents that are caused by, uh, by livestock? And uh, is there a specific time that these things okay that are caused by livestock? Then to, to, to my colleague from Deben uh, Forum, put Forum. Uh, we are also currently working, I know, I probably know that CSIR used to uh, release the state of logistics previously. So we are trying to revise the same thing. And I'm happy that you are alluding to what uh, Creek Mayor and SAF is doing. We are also trying to, to do that and it would be great to engage, but our, our scope is quite big because we want to look at the entire infrastructure. So we want to link the water, the ports, and the roads and the rail so we can engage. And I think what I just want to say about uh, security, I'm not quite sure of the system, we should not overlook the importance of Deben port to the region, as in SADC region. So I'm not quite sure in the system, is there a provision for truck drivers coming from DRC, and everywhere else is there a provision that they can also book because you know some of the some of these countries in terms of technology they are way way behind but they want to export through the Deben Deben port. Thank you. Sorry, just a moment. Um, I'm Christian Defer from the Minerals Council. So from our side, we we concerned about a total blackout. Um, I hear you concerned about the uh, drivers entering the port and what would happen. Now, in terms of a total blackout, if you do not ha have generation, you don't have communications, your phones don't work. Uh, you probably can't even phone a security guard, security people to bring additional people on site. So what I would like to find out is, do, do you have a plan for that? In terms of, is your security company aware that if that happens, they have to bring 500 people to your site? Is the army aware that you have to secure that area? Uh, because, and, and again, are you also able to continue your operations? Because if that happens and there's medication in there, it needs to still go to where it's supposed to go. What, what would be your contingency plan for that? Thank you. We're going to take two more questions, but literally 30 seconds, 30 seconds, because you did ask first. Um, and then we're going to be done and you've got 30 minutes, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, and then we close up. All right. So let's just quickly do yes, Sean. Um, 30 seconds. Just a quick one. I'm Sean from Investipop Forensics. Just to say that we had an incident with the port. We gave the port security a photograph of a suspect uh, on a Wednesday. The Sunday, they found the suspect just on a photograph. So well done to the port security there. Thank you. Yes. Okay. I'm Daniel from I'm Daniel from Integrity Transport Authority. Just from the two colleagues there. Um, in terms of ascetic regions, we're getting trucks bringing goods for export like Zambia, and I, I work on the M7 corridor. Uh, is there any way there's a connection between giving them feedback of all the dangerous driving that's happening in more in the Devon area? Because I'm from the road safety and from the public transport. I like to have that connection so where we can redress this uh, this issue about safe driving on all our roads in Devon coming to the port. Thank you very much. All righty, um, Nico, 30 seconds. Thank you. I think it's two issues. The uh, threat of the 20th of March, obviously within the port, uh, there's a committee called the Port Enforcement Management Committee, uh, which is uh, under the leadership of the SAPS. 
with metropolis uh, and other law important agencies and uh, we are part of that uh, committee and obviously the contingency planning for that is is done at that level and then obviously escalated to the provincial uh, police structures and their law enforcement and coordinating structures and stuff so so it's not something that the the urban port or our ports are an island uh, in terms of the threat for the 20th so it's obviously a bigger a bigger threat so so that's what we are doing uh, and I'm not necessarily going to divulge the contingency plans for the specific uh, day and stuff. So uh, in terms of um, the uh, question around the foreign drivers, uh, obviously with our DTMS, uh, we will have the 24-7 help desk uh, available uh, post-go live. So anybody arriving at the port that hasn't been registered, and we can confirm the booking and all these things the help desk will be there to then assist with the registration process so uh, so they don't necessarily need to have um access to to technology and stuff to do the pre-registration as long as we we know about them uh, we would be able to to help and assist them so thanks thanks my two cents worth <laughs> um yeah definitely i think around the um the 20th of march Luckily, we had a bit of a practice run with the previous looting session, so I think we <laughs> we pretty prepared for for this one. Um, I think in terms of R and D, definitely lots of opportunities. Um, and both ways, if there's things that you guys are doing that you uh, want to interact with, please. My number is on the on the presentations. We'll like to to do to do that. Um, ETA, yeah, Paul is now with us. Is cross across the floor. So I think in terms of, of working together, there's a Durban decongestion task team where you specifically deal with these sort of issues. If you don't get joy there, you're also welcome to take it, bring it to the port forum. Thank you. When honest, and then last words from you, Mark. Okay. Regards to your question there regarding the livestock, uh, you have more problems on the rural roads, which is your farming roads, your R103s and your R617. Um, not so much on the entry. We've got the uh, entry TC who's contracted to Sandrail regarding the road or look after the road from Sidara to Heidelberg, and they're doing a good job there. So well maintained there. Thank you, everyone. I think that's it. Questions asked and answered, and there's a comfort break. And remember to corner young Nico before he leaves. Um, thank you, Harry. Um, program can continue. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's give the panel a hand. Is is Nikki going to present now? <laughs> Let's find out, uh, Nikki Scott. Are you online? Nikki Scott doesn't seem to me she's online, so I don't know you then. All right. All right, uh, ladies and gents, we're going to have Alan Addison. He's from Zolabix. He's going to talk about RTMS requirements. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of us in the room already know quite a bit about RTMS. So for the people that don't know, um, what is RTMS and wh why the need for that? Um, it's it's for the safety on our roads for, for all of us. Um, I'm just going to speak about the presentation. I'm quite, uh, let's call it thrown under the bus with this one. Wasn't expecting it, but... We'll go for it. Um, so RTMS basically, in a nutshell, runs off the SANA standards, 1395.1, uh, um, controls the road safety or assists in the road safety and the traffic management 
of, of, of our vehicles. Um, and this is a self-managed system as, as the, the uh, companies that do operate it already do understand. Um, I, th I think we've got a lot of companies that have already seen a large benefit in, in this. But yeah, let me go through here. Can, you can see it obviously applies to consignees, consignors, um, operators of vehicles, trucks, buses, regardless of, of what operation you're running. RTMS can, can and is applicable to any commercial operation. So to, to how to implement RTMS is firstly get uh, the SANA standards uh, 13.95 from the, the SABS website. Um, this can also be obtained through uh, Zolobix ourselves and JC auditors. We can also assist you in directing you where you need to go. Um, and actually getting an understanding of, of the standard. Um, it, it looks quite cumbersome because it's uh, quite detailed, but it's, it does stipulate what you need, uh, uh, the guidelines that you need to follow. I think once you've actually set that up, you, you get a, partner, a partnership within your business and actually a dedicated team to, to run the system. Um, and it has to be a, a full, full team approach. It, it can't just be a, a tick box exercise. Um, somebody needs to be the champion of it, the same as any department in a business. Um, your admin department is never going to run by itself. There always needs to be somebody that's leading the team. And, and RTMS is no different. You need, you need a leader in the team and to, to make this thing run successfully and, and, and the complete buy-in. From all all staff. Okay, so the, the, pr the process is set out by, by Sanas. Um, is also very simple. It's they they don't prescribe or dictate any systems or policies or procedures. They simply guide the companies um, to actually um, put policies in place. For example, uh, health and wellness policy for your drivers, uh, tire uh, tire policies, and, and and those general general points. Um, and then, because they they appreciate the fact that every business is unique, although we might have ten uh, call operators, everybody wants to run their business with their own uh, um, unique in input and, and their their design because they might feel that it runs better than another business, but. For that reason, you can choose your own policies and procedures, and they just need to talk to the SANAS standards. The, the aim of this, this policy is basically just to um, improve the road safety, improve uh, and protect our infrastructure, and obviously improve the productivity, especially when you're coming to like PBS units, you're improving your productivity. Um, we we have got a speaker that's talking a bit later. Um, he actually was against RTMS in the beginning, but once he had implemented RTMS within their business, they realized that there was a lot of operational incidences that they were sort of neglecting. But after actually the RTMS pointed out, their, like their tire policy, for example, they all of a sudden reduced the amount of tire blowouts that they had. And I think most of us uh, in the logistics will know that if you can have a tire blowout, it's never close to your depot. It's always Harry Smith, Howick, or somewhere on the road. Um, and then obviously you're having impact because you're not getting to your port to catch your time slot for your delivery or you're not getting to deliver to your clients. So you're having delays on your, um, on your on-time uh, uh, delays. So... With implementing RTMS, the customers have actually found that the tire checks are being done far more and they're actually having less blowouts. So therefore, it's actually saving them hand over fist on, on the tire costs alone, the brake costs, driver downtime. Um, I know a couple of years ago, we had a uh, blowout on a, a carrier that we were following. And um, I think the sitting on the side of the road, you're looking at, four to six hours if you're lucky. And that's if 
the tire guys in your area have got the tire that you need and sometimes they don't so yeah it's 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 imperative parts of your business that i think a lot of us should be watching and some of us will watch it but we don't actually document it to actually understand what the issues are and actually drill down to to stop the issues So as I mentioned, uh, SANAS doesn't uh, prescribe uh, or dictate any methods, mechanisms for you to follow. You, you are welcome to choose a number of different methods. And nowadays with the internet, there's thousands of methods that we can uh, choose and uh, to run with. Um, you choose your own policies uh, that's applicable for your business because quite honestly, to run a business with 10 staff and 10 trucks is very different to running an operation with 50, 60, 100, 200, 300 vehicles. The, the, I think the gist of it is pretty much the same. It's just a large operation, but people all want to operate their business on the, with their own unique input. Um, a, a big one for the, for the road safety is obvious uh, that a lot of us are also seeing guys are trying to, especially your, uh, some of us have called them like uh, fly by nights and our one man operators. They try and maximize load and everybody tries to maximize on tonnage because payload is what's bringing, bringing in the dollar bills. And um, load controls is, is, is a big one because that buggers up our roads. It eats the guys' brakes. And that's what's causing a lot of our accidents up and down the, the N3. Once again, uh, falls back to safety, speeding issues, driving, driving uh, times, and a, a lot of this, a lot of our RTMS is is coming back to more your operational side. It's, it's you. Everybody says, uh, "I don't care how you get the load there on time, but just get it to the ports." And then the operation managers' eyes are closed, and sometimes they they push the driver. Sometimes the driver just pushes because he's got another agenda, whatever it may be. Um, but once again, it comes down to driving hours, fatigue. I think many of us have been on the road ourselves. And um, people think you can be a cowboy and drive from Johannesburg or Durban straight down to Cape Town. It's a long drive in a car, never mind in a truck. Try to try do that in a truck uh, yourself. Um, I've, I've done that once or twice where you actually climb in with a driver and it's that's a long drive at 80 k's an hour. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's 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 those type of things, and and the the drivers actually you become bored at 80 k's an hour almost. You so that's why the guys are starting to mess around on phones and stuff like that, and that's why we've actually got companies like C Track that have actually put cameras in the truck so we can see for what's going on with our vehicles and what's happened. Following on that, the driver health and wellness, um, having a look on the roads, obviously we need to do training for the drivers to, to, to uh, how to manage different scenarios uh, on the roads. Fatigue management, um, I don't think we've mentioned it yet, but a lot of the fatigue is due to <coughs> poor eating conditions on the road. Um, and we've got a partnership with uh, Commercial Transport Academy, which Nikki is busy with at the moment. And we we lobbying with a lot of the uh, fuel stations that, uh, up and down the N2, N3, N1 to actually start providing a little bit healthier foods for our drivers. Because at the end of the day, if they have healthier foods, your driver feels better, feels stronger. Not being funny, the guy lives longer. Yeah. So you can actually, you've got an operator that you don't need to keep on training and training and training. So it's 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 a lot of in the past. I think everybody just thought it's like you know what it's a guy's own responsibility, but it's turning back to us that we actually need to be responsible for our staff. Um, yeah, organize, um, organizational productivity. Um, as I just mentioned now, training. You obviously want to retrain your staff all the time. Keep the guys up to date with with the new things, that, uh, new policies, new procedures. And just refresh a training on, on um, how to avoid accidents, what to do if you're in an incident already. Um, and then actually keeping records of that. And without naming and shaming, you actually use those incidences within your own business to 
teach your drivers this and you know, this is what's happened. Um, it's your own industry, so you can actually be be more um, you, you're closer to 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 the thing because there's no use telling somebody in a tanker like listen you're on a car carrier this this and this is the scenario. Tanker situations, especially like our, our blow ups in Johannesburg of late, um, they've got their own scenarios that they need to deal with, and it's 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 extremely dangerous. Implementing RTMS, as, as I've mentioned, the starting point is actually appointing a, a RTMS champion within your business. It doesn't need to be a completely new staff member if, if, if the business is, is not a large one as yet. The, the, the bigger the business, then it starts to become more of a, a full-time job. Um, but on a smaller business, it can still be an operations manager or a admin manager of some sort um, just, just to actually run the process and everybody gives the information back into that, that person. Um, but as mentioned, it, it cannot be done on uh, by yourself. If there's, if uh, there's like five to 10 of you in the business, it, it, it needs to be a collaborative uh, approach. Once you've got your champion, you obviously you, you look at the standards, see see where um, you need to make changes within your business. A lot of us, as mentioned, you um, you're already doing the standard, but you're not actually uh, recording what's going on. So you actually can't analyze the data because you're not keeping records of of what's going on. So at the end of the day, we all want to reduce our incidences, reduce our tire damages, reduce delay times with our trucks. The same as what we're all doing now with the ports. We, we're managing our, our delay times, but now we're not managing our actual uh, uh, asset that we paid two, three, four, five, six million rand for. We just expected just to run. And having a look at the port yesterday, some of those trucks that are pulling containers, they, they shouldn't be pulling trailers with, with mattresses in the back. The, the, the one was so small, it was crazy. Um, yeah, then once you've obviously determined um, what you guys want to actually do, then you choose your certification body, either Zolabix at this point or um, JC auditors, and then or get comparative quotes from both of them to see exactly where you want to go, what you want to do, which company talks better to your business, and um, it, it can actually help you and, and, and all of us within the room to reduce incidences on the roads because one incident on the N3 blocks it sometimes for hours, for days. Um, RTMS, is what some people think is that uh, they can go out, get RTMS, um, Bob's your uncle, done, finished. They got their certificate, the home homework is, is over. It's not the case. Um, that's one of the pains, if you want to call it that, from RTMS. There is quarterly reports. So that we can actually build data to, to make sure that the companies that we are certifying are actually uh, maintaining the standard and not just actually getting it as a tick box exercise. Um, the guys that are getting it as a tick box exercise, they generally end up falling off quite soon. Um, uh, and some customers are very forthcoming with information. Um, we're not asking for um, companies to break popular acts and things like that. It's just data, how many incidences have you had, your, how many speeding incidences have you had, and um, what is being done with those incidences? How have you mitigated them? How, how are you, as a business, um, putting measures in place to actually reduce your speeding incidences, your downtimes, and improving your costs overall at the end of the day? This is a list of um, some of the reports that need to be done uh, quarterly. <laughs> Total number of trips done, kilometers traveled, um, fleet lists, which surprisingly enough, some companies, even though they've got 20, 30 trucks, do not have a fleet list. Um, number of drivers within the business, uh, chronic illnesses, um, and that's unfortunate as well. A lot of companies say, no, no, as soon as we know that the driver's got a chronic illness, then we need to help the guy. So let's, let's just not find out. And it doesn't help you because that, that guy could have a diabetic problem. He has an issue behind the, behind the wheel. And it's the driver that's either 
killed at the incident or injured or worse other families but it's also your truck and your asset and and the company's putting their asset out there and it's your vehicle that will get seen that's been involved in an accident uh, they don't always care about the driver the public are looking at the same company abc needs, needs to pay more attention to the the, the surroundings Lastly, to implement um, is basically do, you can either get an external consultant or it can be done within, uh, within your organization, depending on the size of your organization, um, to do a, a self uh, gap analysis or, an, like I said, external gap analysis just to see where you are with the CNS standards. After that, you can appoint uh, a CB of your choice. Um, both CBs are on the RTMS website with uh, email addresses and contact details. Once a CB has been um, chosen, um, we go through to the stage one audit. Once everybody's happy with the stage one audit, we go through to stage two, and there you go. You've got your RTMS certificates. So it's it's. I'm trying to make it sound a bit easier than what it is. It's not super easy, but it's also not exceptionally difficult it's 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 doable for for many many businesses um for all of us out there and that's that's what the whole rtms standard is out there to do is for, for us to actually keep our assets in safe hands that's it yeah. thank you so much ellen well informed and uh, great presentation. So, Kathy, you're going to now do your thing, hopefully. I is here, Haley. So, Kathy is going to talk about RTMS driving smart risk management. Thank you, Kathy. Right here. So, before I do start, I want to ask a question. Um, what was the standard? What's the SANS number of the standard that young Alan spoke about? There was a hand stretchy. 1395. Okay, you get it. So, he said 1395. <laughs> and he is also a golfer. So it's like satisfying when you give those little shrieks and bullets to a chap who knows what to do with it. Okay. Right here. So, so I'm not putting up a big presentation, and there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. What would be the reason? Alistair, why would I not put up a presentation? Because you're too small and I can't see you. <laughs> because I is too short, and maybe the laptop is too large. Okay. So I think if you look at what I'm trying to say about driving smart risk management, right? Today, Namflanch, ne? Is what it's about. It's about someone out there saying that we've got so many experts. I've just told you now we've got some of the best experts in the world sitting in the room. They are the people like a Dr. Paul Nordeng. And I mean, he's the president of the Intergalactic Society for all sorts of firm. Um, he's better than chat GPT, better than that. So he's better than a bot. Um, and we've got young Oliver, and we've got Alan, and we've got Adrian, we've got even young Stretch, even though he didn't say much, but you did say it was fine. So you've got some, and Unitrans, we've got Unitrans on the line. So you've got real operators that are in the industry that understand what is required. And what we can do as, as Standard Bank um, is what we said yesterday, we want to partner. And how do we partner? We bring together all the stakeholders. So we've got operators in the room. We've got the poor team in the room. We've got young Mark who can offer support. We've got um, old Daniel, the young Daniel from Itaquini. So, and the, Germ the Durban Chamber Port representatives. So essentially what we're doing is we want to, oh, and we've got the media. We have some media, the trade industry as well. Am I right? Yes, we've got some media. So what you're trying to do today is drive the concept of what is smart. So what is smart about RTMS? Well, it deals with everything that you have to in terms of the National Road Traffic Act, which is thousands of regulations. So you can choose to deal with thousands of regulations or you approach young Alan or, or, or Oliver and his team or any one of the consultants, and they can take you through what the requirements are. So I was watching the audience as young Alan was doing his presentation, all the cameras came up about what are the requirements, what is the standard? 
So the reality <laughs> is it's not complex. Is it meticulous? Is it consistent? Do you have a particular process in place? Yes. Do you take shortcuts? No, there's no shortcut to quality. So, so the requirement is that this is your business. If you implement RTMS, that's the smart part in the business. So something I want to share with you. So we've been formally involved as, as um, Standard Bank Group. Uh, we called hashtag one SBG, hashtag one Standard Bank Group. Um, and uh, our approach is that we want to make sure that we want to drive the concept of standards. We're also the standards bank. And um, that was quoted to me by one of the senior engineers from the Department of Transport, Prasanth Mohan. He's the DG infrastructure. What is he? The DG of Prasanth Mohan? Huh? What did you say, young man? He works for the GT, but he's he's the DG of or senior role in infrastructure. Okay. So anyway, so the reason the reason why we, we promote that and we drive that is it speaks to concepts of self-regulation. Self-regulation means that instead of taking all the standards and trying to find a way to obviate or to avoid them or to find a shortcut, it's doing the right thing. So consistently since 2012, since we've had many of our customers on board, so many of the operators that are currently Artemis certified have adopted the standard, but they've gone beyond just Artemis. They've embraced it and they've done huge improvements in their business. I always love to quote a customer called Africa Link. So he was, he had 60, six old scorer scorers. So he went from six old scorer scorers in six years to 60 trucks. And in fact, he's now got more than 90 trucks. So he was an SMME and he was a driver. And he actually was a logistics controller in a business. So he could use RTMS and he could compete with some of the bigger operators. He secured an SAB contract. He secured a contract with, with RCL. He secured a contract with Sopaku Cement. So essentially what RTMS does, it helps you put processes systems in place. The whole organization, as Alan has indicated, and that Oliver will speak to a little bit later on, actually buys into the concept that the driver is the pivot. Everything around the business revolves around the pivot. And the pivot is that the driver must be well-trained, competent, happy, healthy drivers make happy, healthy profits. But aside from that, you also want to make sure that there are processes in place for risk, root risk assessment to make sure that your drivers are also competent. How do you ensure drivers competent? Part of that is you'll hear Nikki's presentation a wee bit later on. It's obviously about driver training. There's a lot of, lot of initiatives. Nikki will speak about the, the Volvo Ironwoman project. She's actually just been to Sweden and she also went to drive an electric and EV vehicle. And you're also going to hear AK Camdar when he speaks a bit later about the concept of that. And it's interesting that many of the operators and many of the presenters that are speaking today have adopted and embraced RTMS, but also opens other doors, which is what Dr. Paul's going to speak about. That's the smart part. It's about, doesn't have to be complex. Uh, the simplicity is in execution. The simplicity is that everybody in the business understands, here's the standard, here are the requirements, let's put people in place to make it happen. I recently spent some time with a customer and we went to the Durban port, we went to Richards Bay port, we went to Komati port, to the border post, and then we did a couple of flyovers over steel port, so your crow mines and the PGM mines and so on. And, and the reality is that they have adopted PBS, they've embraced it in their business. But what they've also discovered is by going with a high capacity vehicle, you reduce a number of things like congestion, fuel consumption, et cetera, because essentially you put yourself in a position where you're maximizing payload and you also can do some improvements. We all know that with the PBS unit, when you're running, spreading your load over more axles, say three axles, you also reduce the road weight. So I think the smart part is we must engage this or, or check GPT, which is the bot, can do our jobs for us. Check, they can actually complete an asset for you, can actually write an article. But the human part is how we interact as business with our stakeholders, with our customers. We've seen that as an organization also, um, adopting um, Artemis has reduced um, the incidence of crashes, the, the value of the cost of the crash for repairs, and then also um, improved profitability. So what we never speak about due to customer confidentialities, we can put up customers operating expenses pre and post RTMS. And there's a marked difference. Fuel consumption has improved um, in terms of um, tire. Tire usage has improved. So in other words, everything around the business, you can even measure it by the numbers because the numbers don't lie, has been improvements. And it's about serious 
doing serious development. So we've got some customers that have in, in, that are in the process of developing some serious additional smart systems. You've got your obviously you've got your telematics companies that can pr provide the dashboard to so make it easier. So you can incorporate it as a, as a single application, or you can incorporate that with own IP in, information for the business. But I think the smart part is that it is simplistic. Right. You can manage it. You can measure it. It has to be adopted by the entire company and it has to be consistently um, applied. So you'll hear some more about RTMS. Um, it is a standard, South African national standard. Um, and by the way, the standard is the best selling standard at SABS. So remember, there are lots of lots of standards out there for laboratories and et cetera, et cetera. So it's interesting to so the industry. So what it tells us is the industry is hungry. The industry wants to do better. The industry wants to adopt best practice. So to drive standards, self-regulation means that we put ourselves in a position as industry, we put up a hand and we try and make a difference. And crashes, we all know from a crash point of view, there are many of those. There can be incidents where it's something beyond our control, but it would be good to understand that there's a reasonable process to make sure instead of all the regulations, you can go to Alta Swanepoel's workshop and all the regulations, all the amendments are there, but with RTMS and it's easy to have access to the standard. And if you listen to all the, all the presentations or you access the Artemis website, there's a lot of free case studies available. Also through Fleetwatch, through Patrick O'Leary, Break and Tower Watch, they have the little Artemis booklet. In the Artemis booklet, you can buy from Fleetwatch online. You can also buy a digital magazine. There's some case studies from other companies that have implemented Artemis and how to adopt Artemis is in the little booklet. Lots of resources, lots of resources available. And, um, and obviously it indicated there are multiple companies from Imperial, Unitrans, um, Baker's Transport. So you've got local operators, KDG, in the province that have adopted the standard. And there's been some significant improvements. And I know that from an Itaquini point of view, uh, there was a presentation done two or three years ago about Durban solid, solid Waste, but they've used the standard for improvements. So they haven't gone full certification, but using the standard to try and identify the gaps for improvements. So that's all I wanted to say, because I know that um, we've got um, comfort break now. But thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. But this is how we drive smart risk management, being in attendance, being hungry for information and engaging and um, networking with the, with the specialists that are here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, uh, Nikki Scott actually just contacted us. He asked. If she can please do a presentation quickly now before we take the break. Uh, she's uh, got another appointment she needs to attend to. So, Nikki, can you kindly speak to us? Let's see if we can see and hear you. I know how dangerous it is to get between a man and his cup of coffee. So, I'm going to be very quick. Um, hello, guys. Hello, hello, hello. Um, let me get my presentation up. And I am sharing. All good. Yes, just go into slide view. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, sharing your screen, where is slide view? Tell me again where that is. Sorry, man. Um, uh, if you go to slideshow and then click on start from beginning. Oh, there we go. And from beginning. We're good. Excellent. Excellent. All right, guys and ladies in the audience and those online, thank you so much for your time this morning. Kathy, um, Transport Forum and um, all the other organizers in this um, event today, thank you for affording me the opportunity um, to present this incredible um, program that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, so what is, what is, what is it? It's Iron Woman, Ultimate Woman, Woman Inspiring Woman in Transport is about people finding solutions. And who are these people? I'm just going to close the side screen here quickly. I can get to it. Um, the people of all the below companies that believe in the inherent value, worth of every person, regardless of age, race, gender, 
to overcome discrimination, poverty, violence, injustice, and the lack of access to quality skills and education. Now, you may be thinking, oh, Nikki, what are we talking about? But the truth is, is that when you're really wanting to transform an industry, when you're wanting to make major change, and when, when I speak to change here, I'm talking to behavior, I'm talking to gender, um, mindset, um, the lack of upward mobility or the ability for a driver to see beyond just being a truck driver, to actually see a, a career progression path. To make those sort of changes requires a tremendous amount of effort and support. Um, and in my opinion, it comes down to embracing human dignity. So the brands that you're seeing on the screen, and this is not all of them, are the brands that have got behind the Commercial Transport Academy and the Women Inspiring Women in Transport, which I'll refer to as WeWIT um, program. Every one of the um, partners on the page um, deliver some sort of service that is, differentiates them from the other. We have not gone into the industry and just try to attract anyone to put out their logos on here. Every one of these organizations add exceptional value to the program. The bottom row are all the operators that have, have and are employing um, our iron women, and there are many more I could not put onto the slide. We are really seeing a wonderful uptake in the industry. So I thank everyone that is here. Um, so, Women Inspiring Women, what is it? Well, we have attracted 3.3 million US dollars to empower 1,200 men and women across the transport value chain. Our program started in 2021 and we'll, uh, this current program will end in 2025. We are developing um, human potential across South Africa um, and I will talk to our expansion shortly. Um, 670 men and women from vulnerable and high-risk communities will become competent commercial truck drivers. We've already developed just over 300 of these individuals. 100 youth will be upskilled to become motorbike drivers. And you think, well, how does that fit into this whole ecosystem? Well, what I discovered when I opened the Cape Town branch was that in Johannesburg and Durban, many of the women and many men in, in, as well present um, for a, a, a job interview with a Co-10 license, but they don't have any driving experience. Um, that kind of was the end of their journey because of funds. And in Cape Town, amongst the Cape Coloured community, and I smile when I say this because they've got all the driving experience, but they don't have the license, so they've been driving illegally. So um, we've had to look at these two models and say, well, how do we create a, a, a value plan that would support them? Um, so in the Western Cape, we took a lot of ladies from no license up to code eight. Those that had a code eight, we took them only to a code 10. And those who had a code 10 that we felt were capable um, of going to an EC extra heavy license, we took them up to that. Um, and the reason being is that I, you know, those brands that I've just shown you, I would not want to put any of them at risk by endorsing a program that was reckless in its upliftment and skills development and expecting the operators to employ someone who has never driven a vehicle beyond getting their license. And sometimes the actual acquisition of the license is questionable. So we brought in the element of the motorbike drivers. We know there's a massive shift with the uh, delivery of our um, groceries with 6060 and the Woolworths and the pick and pay and soon to be the spa program. We know the, um, um, what's the one I'm looking, the labs um, that deliver blood work, make use of a lot of drivers. And then, of course, there's the general driver that works at an at a, um, office environment. We want to get more women into that space. And I felt if I could empower the 18 to 22-year-olds, we could give them two to four years of really being in an intense, high-traffic, vulnerable space Um where they would have to manage stress, they have to manage dealing with a customer, they probably, some of them have to deal with electronic POD equipment, um, but basically they will learn the very best observation skills, which to me is a critical skill for any truck driver. What we often see with new drivers is their extent of their um, ability to drive is to look directly at what's happening in front of their windscreen and maybe the first car in front of them. We're trying to get people to look 
five to eight cars ahead um, and to start to make good decisions to um, in defensive decisions. Entrepreneurs is a really exciting one. We're developing 300 entrepreneurs for the transport, mining, construction and agriculture um, space. The reason why we've extended beyond transport is there actually isn't 300 female entrepreneurs in the space. And the ones that are in the space are truly struggling to get a foothold, to get an opportunity to sit in front of a procurement department or a procurement officer to, to, to um, access work. So what we see is a lot of women are accessing contracts. So they consign or issues their tenders. The brokers are getting the ten, some of these tenders. The brokers are then contracting their tender to these late, some of the ladies that have come onto our program. And then they subcontracting to the cheapest and some of the most reckless transporters. And we have started to look at the accountability that these women have by engaging in this practice and starting to return their mindset and turn them into thinking about building sustainable um, businesses and responsible businesses. And then of course, we're running um, 120 um, international diplomas. 95 of those positions have already been completed. Thus, this is the biggest transport program in South Africa. Nothing comes near it in terms of the complexity and the volume of people that will be upskilled through this program. And I hope that at some point in time, you will have at least one beneficiary in your organization um, as, as a supplier, as a driver, or maybe as an employee in your leadership team. But what's truly exciting is we've now got funding to create safer stops. This will be a sister organization to the likes of the RFA. I've already chatted to Gavin and to Basil, um, um, who's exiting obviously Zaboa. But the whole idea is that while they fight the political battle and it's a major battle, we want to work on the ground with the drivers. We want to go, and I'm going to see if the next slide is going to show this. No, we want to go so far as to start evaluating the truck stops by means of an app where the driver will evaluate a truck stop based on the cleansiness, the conditions, the parking facilities, the security, the food that's served, the add-on um, value that they can extract from the truck stop. Um, so maybe like things like having their blood pressure taken, um, uh, nutritional knowledge and so forth. We want to have a look at truck stops starting to implement gym equipment to help the drivers to stretch and to be a little bit more mobile after a long day of driving. These are all things that have been requested by the drivers in two academic studies on truck stops. Um, we want to start uh, assisting employers on what's happening on the ground, where they should be best um, um, letting their drivers stay over, how they can start to put pressure on the entire environment and the ecosystem. The Safer Stops is a collaborative program. It will work with the entire industry to look at everything from the telematics that will support the drivers on route to create safe passage and safe travel. And we've got some really exciting stuff happening with SeaTrack, which I will wait for them to speak to the market about, which we'll be piloting in the coming weeks. But um, this will be across the, the fuel companies, the forecourts, the drivers, the employers, the associations, and the unions. And ultimately, I'd love to be in a position where I can redesign a PDRP, that it is no longer a tick box of a medical and a crim check, but that it is actually a professional qualification based on continuous learning and improvement and development that can start to drive better road safety in South Africa. So a lot happening in the coming years. Um, and I'll ask you, if you aren't already following me on LinkedIn, then you can find me, it's Nikki Scott Anderson, but there is a slide coming up at the end. Um, please do so that you can keep in touch of what's happening and how you can get involved. Um, the Iron Woman Programme, meets the requirements of seven of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, proving in, um, and is committed to improving human dignity. And in Kathy's words, it is just simply the right thing to do to get involved in this program. So what is it? If we look at the, the development of the truck drivers, just specifically the truck drivers, we have gone to the effort of meeting the criteria of almost every employer in South Africa in terms of age, 23 to 45, they have to have an EC, um, C1 license or an EC license. They have to pass a in-cab driving assessment before they can enter the program. 
Um, they have to pass a literacy and numeracy assessment. They have to pass a MIE criminal check, ID license, and PDRV, PRDP verification, as well as a highest education verification. The reason why we do highest education because a lot of the guys present with a fraudulent matric certificate. And for me, that's the start of the dishonesty in the relationship. So if I can eradicate the, the risk there, the other stuff can't really be um, fuzzed, but that does. Um, so we, we always do that. If you're not doing it in your own organization, maybe consider it. A full medical assessment is done. The reason being is we often pick up women that are pregnant at the start of the program. We don't allow them to enter the program until they've had their baby and they are back on their feet and they're physically fit to start the program. We won't eliminate them um, from future prog um, programs, but it is just not a responsible practice to start them on this journey when they are pregnant. But also we are looking for some of the major health conditions, which is issues with eyesight, issues with hypertension, diabetes, and some of the others that we are measuring. Um, and they have to get through at least two interviews. The program is really comprehensive, guys. I'm not going to read through this whole slide. Um, there is my driver trainer. I'm so proud of him, Roy David. He's a real cool individual down in Cape Town, and he just has the most amazing ability to transfer knowledge in the most positive way. Um, and he never makes anyone feel like they're stupid. And I'm really so proud of him. But Roy and uh, Johannesburg and Durban driver trainers really put a lot of time into incorporating a number of the unit standards from the NCPD, uh, which is the National Certificate of Professional Driving, to educate the learners on all the elements. So please just have a look at the slide as I'm speaking. And then what we also do is push the learners to get PC experience. So we make sure they're PC literate. And there's two reasons for this is number one, some of the actual programs are on um, the PC, but also I'm looking for a backup that should one of our ladies um, become pregnant along their employment journey, they can then be of value as a dispatcher, um, um, as a, uh, you know, some sort of administration um, uh, uh, assistant within the business. But from all the experience I've had with the ladies, and I talk about pregnancy because it's probably one of the most fearful things for the operators. What do I do? I can't lose a driver for four plus months due to pregnancy. Well, there is no norm. There is no standard. Each pregnancy is measured on its own. And most, I have yet to have a lady have to leave employment due to an unhealthy pregnancy um, or a challenging pregnancy. They literally work until month eight and a half, and then they take their um, maternity leave. We've had ladies go against the rules and return to work as early as three weeks after having had their baby, even though legislation says six. So we also do a tremendous amount of personal development. This, All these pictures, by the way, are of our classrooms and of our learners. Um, and it's woman inspiring woman. It's really, you know, there is this belief that women don't support women. And for many uh, levels, it is true. But in this program, we develop the most amazing cam camaraderie um, with friendships. And each cohort of women has their own personality within that cohort. And these go on to be relationships that support these ladies for years after the program. So they do a lot of work around managing personal finance. How do you create a budget? You know how many women have, have never, ever had the opportunity to understand how to budget um, social media presence, how do you behave in social media, um, mitigating gender-based violence, sexual harassment in the workplace, HIV problem solving, and then physical, emotional, and sexual well-being. This is really around physical, what we're seeing a lot of ladies picking up weight after they get their jobs. We think it's got to do with the fact that women are so social that they, haven't, they can't talk to anyone in their trucks, so they eat for comfort. Um, so a lot of work is having to be done to like really mitigate that. And I think it's really funny, but it is what we're seeing and we're working on it. Emotional, you know, just dealing with the stress of the industry. It's, I mean, it's, in the, it's truck driving is in the top five most dangerous jobs in the world. So we have to prepare men and women adequately for this, the emotional drain, not just what they will feel, but how it impacts them with their families Please don't forget that many of the men that work in your companies, if you haven't already started employing women, um, the leading cause um, of destruction of their being is depression. 
Um, many truck drivers suffer from depression because they become onlookers into their families. They're ba barely involved, and especially if they work for companies that require them to work 21 days on, five days off. Sexual well-being really looks at uh, family planning. So, you know, not starting a brand new job and then deciding you want to have some kiddies, um, but really sort of helping them understand. And that goes hand in hand with career development. Um, Nikki, three minutes. three minutes. Fantastic. This is my last slide. Why employ women drivers? Well, I mean, Kathy said it. It's the right thing to do. The data is supporting. They have fewer accidents and incidences. Their vehicle sympathy is far better, reducing the cost of wear and tear. Their um, fuel consumption is better, vehicle sympathy is better, higher customer service. All of this relates to bottom line savings. But most of all, women make up 51% of the available workforce. Why are we not tapping into them? I shouldn't be having a conversation to motivate them coming into the access into the industry. There are around 150 ladies that are in temporary positions between Johannesburg, Durban, and the Cape Town working for leading listed companies that are looking for permanent positions. So I ask you, please, I want to go through those. Um, please to reach out to us. Here's our contact details. Kathy can share them. Alan is in the room. He can share them as well. Give more women the opportunity to be as proud as this young lady is having completed her EC license, her soft skills, her technical skills, and the ability to operate a six by four truck tractor with a van body, or with a refrigeration body, I should say. So I thank you for your time and I hope I've got the message across clearly. Thank you so much, Nikki. What a great presentation. Really appreciate you spending some time with us. And we're looking forward to see this program progressing and also contributing to the process of transport in South Africa. Thank you very much. Um, just I know Nikki is not available for some time. Is there a burning question for Nikki, perhaps in the audience? Nikki, it seems to me everybody is happy. So thank you thank very you. much. We'll be in touch. Thanks a lot, Nikki. Pleasure. Have a good day, guys. Cha cha bang. Thanks. Bye. Right, ladies and gents, it's now time to take a comfort break. Um, let's try and be back here at 11.45. And uh, then we'll continue with more exciting presentations. Can I ask that Mark and Ellen please come and see me quickly? Thank you.
Right, ladies and gents, let's start taking up our seats again so that we can start. All right, let's uh, let's settle down. I'm going to make one round into the lobby again to see if I can get more back. Okay, right. Seems to me that uh, the right wing is stronger than the left wing. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gents, uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Paul Nodgenen to come and say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Nodgenen, and I will be giving a presentation uh, just now. But I just asked Harry if I could take one minute of your time just to, it's a, quite a special occasion. You know, we've had this COVID and all these virtual meetings, and we don't know what people look like. And actually, I realized that today is quite a special occasion because it's the first time, I think, in more than three years that we basically got all the RTMS directors present. Because the rest of the program and the ones we had just before the tea break is all focusing on the road transport management system. And there's going to be a few more presentations on that. So I thought it's a good occasion just to, for those of you who are here, to let you know, look, I'm, so I'm one of the directors, and we've got Chris Stretch from the KZN Department of Transport, um, Christian Tefo, if you stand up, he's from the Minerals Council of South Africa, he's a director, it's a non-profit company, as you probably know, and then Adrian Fantonda, who used to be with Bala World, he's now with Avis, he's come down, and then... Um, 
Mavis Mplanga, she couldn't make it. She might be online, but she's, she's based in Pretoria. So we, we five directors. And in fact, I, we decided to have a RTMS National Steering Committee meeting today uh, after this workshop so that there'll be a number of phys uh, people here physically. Um, and that's, so that's why quite a few of the directors are here. Um, so that's great. And then also, I just mentioned on the steering committee also here, we've got Francois Oberholzer, who's going to be presenting just now. He's from Forestry South Africa. Kathy Bell, I think some of you might know from Standard Bank. Um, Nikki Scott, who presented from Commercial Transport Ac Academy. Uh, Alan Anderson from Zolibix. And then Oliver Naidu from JC Auditors. So it's, uh, it's really great to have. Uh, this is our first sort of physical workshop we've had, as I said, since uh, the end of 2019 so yay <laughs> yeah so thanks thank you so much dr paul uh, indeed a great moment having all of the the relevant people here today and we blessed having that ladies and gents let's continue with our program we're going to have Mr. Oliver Naidu. He's a proud gold sponsor of the Transport Forum as well. He's the Chief Executive Officer of JC Auditors. He's going to talk about RTMS audits, key trends. Thank you, Oliver. Georgia than you are. Thanks very much, Harry. And yeah, um, welcome again to the session. And I hope that uh, I'll be able to shed some insight in terms of what our GMS is, specifically on key trends. I should say, is Kathy here? I've been a standard bank, uh, a standard bank, what do you call card member since 1979. So I finally got some free stuff from them with the scones. <laughs> so thanks. So thanks for. <laughs> Thanks for organizing that, Kathy. I really appreciate it. But also, yeah. <laughs> but I never had scones before, hey? <laughs> Good. Well, thanks for that. With the cream, yeah. But as, as Paul was saying, you know, I mean, I think Francois here, Oberholzer, he was the first, well, one of the first pioneers of the RTMS with Chris and Paul. And it took me back to 18, 19 years ago. Uh, and of course, it, yeah, it, it's really quite special to be here. So thanks very much. So what I'd like to do is just chat to you around. Um, oh, Harry, oh, there we go. Uh, around some of the key trends we've seen with the RTMS. Um, so you know, we know that it's all about safety and compliance, right? And you can see some of those icons it just depict what the message should be: vehicle safety checks, minimizing driver fatigue. Um, I need to put my glasses on. Preventive maintenance, um, compliance with the road regulation. As as you know, we have some of the best regs in the world. The sad reality: we have inadequate enforcement and lack of compliance. And that's what our team is about, lady. Doing the right thing. I mean, Chris Stretch in his opening made that personal anal analogy. When you're on the on the road and you've got a 56-ton rig behind you. Is that driver compliant? Are those tires okay? Are the brakes functional? So if you're a transport owner, have you got that kind of mindset where you're regulating and you're managing your own fleet as opposed to you know, hoping for the best? So that's kind of um, those icons just depict and remind us of, of what the basics of the standard is. And I can quote Adrian Fantonda, his famous line from our workshops. He's always said, our team is is simply the 101 of transport. And as an operator, I'm sure you recognize all those icons, right? It's something you have to do day in and day out. But how do you do it consistently? That's the key, um, the, the key I think, uh, pr um, focus really for RTMS. Now, although RTMS is a safety and compliance standard, oh, sorry, that's probably my, it's after Valentine's Day, I don't know why. Sounds ringing all the time. Um, so I should say, in terms of the RTMS benefits, right, we often think safety and compliance 
is not profitable. The converse is true. Yes, it does take energy to get safety and compliance in, but it's a win-win, the proverbial win-win, right? So RTMS we've seen does increase profitability. And if you're a transporter or a business owner, you know, you need the money in the bank to be sustainable. So when your fleet runs like a well-oiled machine, your expenses drop and profits rise. And as your bottom line improves, you can grow the business um, and, and make, make a bit more money. And that's important for business owners, right? So I should say RTMS is not um, exclusive to profits. In fact, it, it encourages and helps to give you a base so you can be profitable. Service delivery. We know in today's uh, business world, your clients are asking you for value add. They want it today. They want it delivered better, quicker, faster, with all the frills. So having RTMS as a base helps your company to deliver on your orders and services on time, and you get happy customers. And that, of course, is absolutely critical in whatever line of work you are in today. Increased efficiency, and I think um, Paul will cover this in, uh, well, in a different way in PBS, and AK will probably chat about this as well. If your fleet is managed properly, your vehicle lifespan, for example, is extended, you improve your fuel efficiency, reduce your carbon footprint, and all of that does translate to a, a cost benefit and a profit gain as well. And the driver performance from what we've seen, some of it's been anecdotal, but a lot of it's been quantified reductions in crashes, reductions in incidents. So RTMS monitoring, and I'm sure you've, you've gathered by now that a big part of the RTMS requires a diligent monitoring of the driver. So monitoring helps to spot unsafe behaviors, and it provides you with data that you can use to change the culture and modify driving behavior. So it helps with all the, you know, the normal operational stuff, harsh braking, excessive um, or harsh acceleration, excessive idling, um, you know, aggressive lane change and all of that. So it, it helps you to have a framework to monitor your drivers as somebody is consciously uh, checking and where there are anomalies or, or, or negative behaviors, the, the standard compels you to then say, listen, guys, we need to act and do something about it before it becomes a crash. So once it's a crash, you know, it, it's, it's done. So the idea is you want to monitor behavior, track negative trends, and do something about it before it becomes a crash. So uh, coming to my, the main po point of my um, sort of discussion today, these are key trends we've seen from audits we've done more than 15 years, which is probably around 6,000 odd audits. Um, but, but this snapshot is the last 50, right? In that, we found 261 uh, non-conformances, as they're called. This is comparing uh, companies that, that have not been certified, right? So the first audit, what was found, and this is a summary of that to give you an idea of the typical kind of challenges that transporters are faced with. So the top five findings relate to inadequate driver training, so behavioral issues. Overloading is also a significant, um, a significant contributor to the initial audit findings. Driver fatigue, I mean, we all see daily trucks going off the road, right? It's happening more frequently than ever before. And that clearly points to inadequately managed driver fatigue or sometimes illnesses that are not well managed. Speed violations, um, um, high speed or unsafe speed influences the risk of a crash and the intensity. So if you crash at a high speed, the likelihood of fatalities and injuries is far greater than if it's a low speed crash. And then pre-trip inspections. It, it, it's sad that a lot of time drivers assume the truck is okay, but it needs to be checked every day every trip. Things change by the minute. So these are the five major findings that often present the biggest challenges to transporters. And the RTMS actually hopes to look at your fleet and to identify what are the key risks. And although it's called an audit, and it is an audit, right? People get a bit scared with the audit approach. And we've been trying to um, educate transporters to understand it's not here to catch you out or to find out and to penalize you. It's the, the aim of the RTMS 
is to help you identify what are your risks, make you understand what you need to do to improve your, your, your um, performance so that the standard can be improved. That's just a summary of all the other audit findings. Um, and I'll just talk through some of them, uh, again, to give you an idea of the typical operational issues that present a challenge. I'll put my glasses on. As I've mentioned, speed violations, we find sometimes it's high frequency, meaning the truck is constantly at 87 kilometers or 90 k's per hour, so it's highly frequent. Or sometimes we get low frequency, but high extent. So it might be isolated speeds of 120 kilometers and per hour. Now, can you imagine a truck fully loaded, 56 tons, 120 k's going down Town Hill? Criminal, right? So the, the audit looks at both high frequency violations and high extent, and both would elicit, uh, would need to have corrective actions. Often we find that the, the tracking is set at 80 kilometers per hour. So if he's in the 60 zone doing 79, nobody gets warned. So it's important when you are configuring your telematics that you are, um, you are configuring it for the specific zone that the truck is in, or bus. Inadequate driver training, we found that in some cases at the first audit, there was zero driver training, none at all. And that's really a big problem because like any behavior, if there isn't a continual refresher, continual engagement, it's unlikely to change behavior. And behavior change is a key part of the RTMS. Sometimes we found that training did not address all the requirements so the driver was trained how to drive, but he wasn't trained on, on load securement, or he wasn't trained on the correct inflation pressure. Inflation pressure is critical, obviously, for fuel consumption and also for safety. So those are the kinds of findings that we found where there's either nothing at all or a severe lack of some critical components. Overloading, um, as you probably would have heard earlier, the current um, tolerance is 4% um, for the RTMS uh, to be achieved. That doesn't mean you, you should aim for that percentage, right? It just means <laughs> due to practical reasons, especially with bulk commodities, it's, it's very impossible to achieve on, on target loading every single trip. So the tolerance is there just to help with, with that kind of practical issues. And then sometimes we find there was severe overload. So it's, it's low frequency, but it might be over 60 tons. Sometimes we found recently 72 tons uh, on a truck. So it's like 60 tons overloaded or a total of 60 tons on the truck. Okay, a total of 60 tons. So it's four tons overloaded, but sometimes it goes up to 72, which is recently we found to be the case. <laughs> Look, when we audit you next, when we audit you next, I'll remember that comment. <laughs> and, and surprisingly, incorrect payload calculation. A lot of guys don't know how to cal calculate their payload, even some fairly you know, big transporters. So um, yeah, we need to sometimes educate and train as well. Driver fatigue, as I've mentioned, often we find at the initial audit, shift hours of more than 15. Now, can you imagine the driver is working say 16 hours, he gets home in the next hour, he's sleeping for two, three hours, and he's back at work the next morning. How do you expect that lady or gent to perform adequately? He's never going to be able to do it, right? So the lack of uh, duty roster is another finding. And sometimes on the long haul, the driver needs to have a rest stop. If he's driving Durban to Cape Town, he can't just do a single trip. It's impossible, right? But the trip or the journey plan should make provision for rest stops, etc. Vehicle pre-trip inspections, what we found is that there were either missing inspections, in other words, there was no evidence that the truck was checked or the bus was checked, or sometimes the, 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 it has been checked, and you can see the example on the screen, the driver records the defect, but the controller says, ah, oh, we, we need to get production out, let it go. So it's really important if, if the truck or bus has a safety critical defect. The RTMA standard says that vehicles should not be allowed to operate until the defect has been, has been repaired. 
tire surveys, here we found that there were either no tire surveys conducted, so the guys had no idea of the inflation pressure or tread depth or tire matching, um, which means they were pretty much losing money for one, but also exposing themselves to undue risk. Five minutes, okay, I have to go on a bit faster. Harry's giving me the sign. Uh, the five minute sign, that is, what were you thinking? Okay, driver medicals, um, they were either not done or they were sometimes done, but inadequately, inadequate management of chronic illnesses. So what the standard says, if your driver has been diagnosed with um, diabetes or hypertension that could impact on his driving ability, then as a, as a business, you need to put in place a, a system that can mitigate the higher risk associated. It could be more frequent clinic visits. It could be uh, more training and awareness. It could be the fleet controller asking him about his health and well-being. So all of these mitigating measures need to be done consistently to achieve the desired end. Because remember, it just takes one driver on one day, one incident to cause a Boxburg, right? So part of the RTMS challenge is how do you do it? How do you consistently implement the requirements to mitigate um, these uh, high consequence crashes, et cetera? Okay, truck service overruns. Um, sometimes we find they are frequent overruns, sometimes severe. So frequent would be a high number just over the interval, like for example, under a thousand Ks over the interval. Or sometimes you can get a complete skip where they skip a service or it's like 8,000, 10,000 kilometers over the interval. Uh, vehicle speed monitoring, um, here it's inadequate monitoring of speed, inadequate overloading monitoring, uh, inadequate monitoring of traffic infringements. Uh, and I should say, if you are RTMA certified, then RTO, if it does come, shouldn't be feared, because part of the RTMA standard requires for all traffic fines to be monitored and mitigating measures done. Okay, now I'm going to run through it quite quickly. Well, Harry's going to give me dirty looks again. Alcohol testing, not implemented, was a, another main audit finding. Risk assessments, not available. Root risk, that is. And I can't overestimate. Oh, sorry. Give it to me. I can't over... Thank you, AK. You've got a MSC, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can't overemphasize overemphasize the need, um, where was I? Uh, oh yes, uh, risk assessments. Because often the drivers, especially if it's a new driver, he doesn't know the route. If he's not told about the heavy descent or about heavy mist, he won't know, and then you blame the guy. So it's important. Okay, I'll skip through it. Documents not available. Sometimes management functions were not in place. So things like, is the management aware of the performance? Are they taking actions? And, and permit conditions. Okay, um, I'll, I'll run through this quickly. So this is the typical audit scenario. In this case, you can see the highlights. The auditor found vehicle speed to be an issue, right? Uh, he generated non-conformance. The company in question then, uh, as part of the corrective action, put in place a speed policy, which, uh, which, which, uh, of which the contents are there. They then had toolbox talks and they took photographs of the toolbox talks with the drivers sent it through to us together with the telematics report for a recent period. We looked at the report and as you can see, it's all well under 80 on, on a national road. So that's the kind of approach the audit would require. If there's findings, you, you mitigate, correct, and you submit evidence thereof. And in, in conclusion, I'm just going to play a video, which is two minutes more. Harry, sorry, is it okay? Can I do it? Can I go for it? Thanks. Okay, I'm not sure why it's not playing. RTMS is a national standard promoting safety, compliance, and efficiency in fleet operations. It promotes a framework in order to minimize crashes, ensure vehicle safety, promote safe driving behavior, and ultimately allow for an effective efficient supply chain, which is essential for economic growth and global competitiveness. Let's look at the four pillars of the RTMS standard. One, 
Correct vehicle loading is essential, making sure that the mass and dimensions limits of the National Road Traffic Act are complied with. If a truck is overloaded, it not only damages our roads, but it is also a safety risk as the vehicle braking and handling is compromised. Our roads are a national asset, so by preventing overloads, we preserve our roads and make them safer. So whatever you are loading, be it bulk or brake bulk, make sure to load correctly and safely, taking care to distribute the load across all axles. The RTMS standard also requires safe load securement, so make sure that load is correctly and tightly secured to avoid dislodgement during transit. 2. Safety of vehicles. The second pillar of the RTMS is safety and safe operation of the vehicles. A structured preventative maintenance program is essential. This includes tire management and maintenance of the trailers. Of course, in addition to preventative maintenance, it is essential that pre-trip safety inspection is conducted daily. It is widely accepted that more than 80% of crashes are due to driver error, so managing driver behavior is a crucial requirement of the RTMS standard. One of the main causes of crashes is driving at unsafe speeds, so monitoring of driving speed is a key requirement of the RTMS. 3. Driver health and wellness. The third pillar of the standard is driver health and wellness, which requires that the drivers are assessed for fitness to drive. The standard also requires a fatigue management plan, including a driver duty roster, monitoring of duty hours and driving hours. It is critical that drivers get enough sleep to avoid falling asleep at the wheel. Another wellness requirement is the screening of drivers for possible intoxication, which we know prevents a severe risk impact. 4. Driver training. The fourth pillar of the RTMS standard is the requirement for a structured driver training program to be in place. The training program should focus on key criteria including defensive driving techniques such as keeping a safe following distance, driving at a safe speed, avoid using a cell phone while driving, driver health and wellness. So as can be seen, RTMS is all about managing risk and promoting safety in a fleet operation. The RTMS has been implemented by leading transport companies since 2006 and is widely accepted as the gold standard for fleet operators. RTMS, it's simply doing the right thing. Thanks very much, Harry. Thank you, Oliver, for a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. And it's always great having you at the panel. And I'm quite sure they're looking forward to engaging with you in the panel discussion. So, ladies and gents, let me get the program up for us. Our next presenter, then, let me go to that page, will be Mr. Francois Weberolzer. He's Operations Director. Forestry South Africa is going to talk about RTMS and PBS in the forest forestry industry. Thank you very much, Francois. Let's just get these slides loaded quickly. Thank you. Um, while we're loading the, just a bit of a background, as Oliver mentioned, we've been uh, busy with uh, RTMS and PBS since 2004. Um, both uh, him and Paul all had hair back then. Chris is the only one, he's a bit like Leon Kravach and he still looks the same as he did 20 years ago. And um, so I worked for an organization called Forest Engineering South Africa, looking at the transport side. Then uh, I went into operations. So for, I'm with Forestry South Africa now for the last four years, but before that, I was the logistics manager for Tekwani Sawmills Nominee Farms, where I managed uh, for about six uh, years, where I managed a fleet of uh, 80 trucks of which uh, 20 were PBSs and uh, 60 uh, conventionals. And then uh, on top of that are about 400 other bits of equipment. So I've been on both sides of the, of the, of the equation, the operation side, then on the technical side as well. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so just a bit of a history there. In the forest industry, we've been trying to get a handle on overloading since uh, I joined the forest industry in 1996. And um, we had very little success because we realized that um, our roads are getting damaged, etc. We could also see that the cost of our transport was increasing and we had to ask ourselves, why, why is that? And um, 
in, in talking to the CSR then at the time uh, and the Department of Transport, we could see that uh, there was a rise in maintenance cost to the tune of uh, 10 billion rand per annum, and, and it was rising, and that was back then. So there was a, a, a serious increase in, in the cost of um, maintaining the roads, and we could see that the maintenance schedule was falling behind. And having a look at some of the results that the CSR presented, overloading had one of the biggest impacts on uh, on the pavement structure and damaging the pavement there. At that point, our overloading in the industry ranged between 15 and 20%. And no matter what we could do, what we do, we, you know, we just couldn't get it down. So this is what our overloading looked like at the time. And you'll see there in 2006, um, it was limited from, I think, 5% uh, axle or 5% uh, combination to 2% on combination. And that our overloading stats then was still the same, but it just uh, looked a bit worse than it than it was there at the time. Yeah, so you can see the reduction in tolerance there. So we feel that something had to be done. At the same same time, we then started uh, talking to uh, so, uh, Andrew Crickman from Crickman Associates. They were looking at an initiative to reduce overloading, and then also Paul from the CSIR. And they were looking at self regulation. And this concept of self-regulation was quite new to us, but we could see the merit uh, in that. And the main thrust there was um, manage um, the risk associated with infrastructure deterioration, get a handle on that. Um, then one of the threats from the Department of Transport is they were going to reduce the gross vehicle mass in order to reduce overloading. So we tried to mitigate that risk by going the self-regulation route. Um, we also then started looking at something that would incentivize people to go for RTMS. Because when we introduced the concept of RTMS to our members in the forest industry, they simply laughed it off. They said, forget it. This is the Department of Transport's job to regulate. And it's not our job to regulate. And so we had to fight tooth and nail to get our members to accept it. But then the concept of PBS came about. And we could horse trade here a little bit and say, okay, if you go the RTMS route, there could be the PBS uh, on top of that for, for, for good behavior. And then we started getting buying from the guys there. And there's also then the associated uh, safety, driver wellness, et cetera, that Oliver just uh, uh, spoke about. So the RTMS was started as the load accreditation program there in 2003. Um, and then later on got renamed to, uh, to RTMS there. The first transporter was accredited in 2004 to Milan Transport out of Underberg. And back then, our target for industry was sitting at 4%. We wanted to get up from 15 to 20% down to 4%. And eventually in 2015, we went down to 1%. And that is our results um, over the years. So as you can see, it was massively high. And then we've managed to reduce it to consistently around the 1% margin where we are at the moment. And uh, where we are fortunate is that the forestry industry is, is fairly, I wouldn't say vertically integrated, but the growers are also the mill owners. So for argument's sake, if you look at Sapi Saikor down at uh, Mkumas or Mondi Mere Bank or Mondi Richards Bay, they're all part of the forestry sector. And they just said, the rule is no more overloads and, and uh, this is gonna be the rules going forward. Trucks that are not loaded uh, properly, we're going to reject. Overloaded trucks, we're going to reject. And that played a massive role to get um, the overloading under control there. So Artemis has really, really worked for us. And in, from where I've managed it as well, it, it really paid dividends. Um, as Oliver mentioned, we need your training. You need to look at your drivers and implement systems. And implementing systems, the, the best thing I could have done is to put a proper tracking system. Uh, a fleet management system, not just tracking. Tracking is a dot on a map. That's any, any guy can provide you with that. As we get proper intelligence, we tap into the CAN bus of the vehicle and you get all the information from the CAN bus. Uh, mixed telematics, et cetera. Those guys can do it for you. And from there on, you can build your own platforms uh, in terms of data. When your vehicle is longer than a, a certain time in a certain location, you get alarms. Those kind of... Uh, systems that you compile for yourself that work for your own business. That makes your management so, so much easier. 
All right, then on to PVS. The first PVS vehicle was launched in the timber industry in 2007 by Timber 24. This is after Paul, myself, and a couple of people visited, um, went to Australia, went to have a look at what they do there, came back and got permission from the DRT. We were really, really surprised um, by their buy-in, but we're very grateful for that. So if I look at the, the freshest results that, uh, that we've got, it's December 2022. We've got about 220, uh, 227 vehicles operating in the forestry industry. Um, the number of other vehicles are unknown because a lot of track tractors would pull a timber truck in the morning and a sugarcane truck in the afternoon, et cetera. So, but there's, you know, I'd say close to a thousand or so of conventional trucks. The trips done for December, 8,723 with PBSs and 23,023 with conventional trucks. So 27% of our loads were moved by PBS and 73% were moved by conventionals. The volume moved, you'll see, was 33% by PBS and 67% by conventional. So obviously the PBS has moved much more volume than the conventionals. Number of overloads, 59 on the PBS, which is 0.68% of all the trips, and 249 conventionals, 1.08%. But the interesting one is to just see the extent of overloading. The average overload for PBS is 973 kilogram. And you'll get that. Load cells are not perfect. For some reason, whenever it rains, I'm talking forestry sector now, the load cells would go haywire. Um, so you'll get, I'm not condoning it, but you'll get an overload here and there. But that's the way you've got your management structures in place. On conventionals, it was double that. 1,827 kilograms was the average overload there. So you can see PBS really, really pay off there. Um, you've got less trips with, with more volume. So let me just show you some of our configurations. This is the, I would say the, our bread and butter configuration. Um, most of the PBS vehicles look like this. That was, that's a very good question. This was a photo opportunity from Mercedes Benz. And the, the guy that was there to take their photos, they just traveled a couple hundred meters for the photo. And only afterwards did they realized that they forgot to put the straps on. So that would not go on a road. Sappy, Mondi, and the other malls will all reject it if they see it arrive at a mall without uh, strapping. So that's a good point, glad you picked it up. But that is the classic you'll see. So it's, it's got the three axles at the back and that is a 67.7 ton gross combination and a payload of 45 uh, plus minus 45 tons versus the 38 tons that we achieve on our conventionals. The reason why we get a high payload is because we've got skeleton vehicles. We don't carry a lot of steel. Yeah. Yeah. So here's a, another one, again, a photo opportunity on a depot. This one is 73.7 tons gross combination, payload of 50 tons. As the vehicles get bigger, the axis get more limited. So something like this would classically just travel up and down the N2, a little bit of the N3, while the one on the previous page will do a bit more dirt road, just due to the maneuverability and the overtaking capacity, uh, overtaking ability of these vehicles. Yeah, but as I say, there's also a photo opportunity. <laughs> Never trust the, the guys who would take the photos to actually do it when uh, they just, this was my truck, so I'm proud to say because they're strapping. <laughs> so interesting on this one, um, with this one, we uh, had a backhaul. So this one carried timber from the Maritzburg area to Richards Bay. All those extensions would fall down and will carry an aluminum slabs back uh, from uh, Richards Bay to Peter Maritzburg. This one, um, I forgot to put the, it could carry also a payload of about 50 tons. And I think the combination one is around 75 around there somewhere. Um, when add up the axles, one will get to it. Uh, obviously a bit more steel because you can see the steel, these decks here that to carry the aluminum. Um, the aluminum slabs could rest on the uprights, but the ingots had to, to sit on the decks. But the important point is PBS is not just about going bigger. It's, it's about what is innovative. And as you can see, this is a, an innovative design where you get a steering back axle, where you've got very, very tight corners. This is not in South Africa. This is taken in Europe somewhere. Um, no straps, but um, you'll see the, that's the steering back axle 
on very tight corners. And when we went to Australia, it was actually so interesting to discuss with them their PBS concepts. As I say, bigger is not necessarily better. They've got a rule in Melbourne that you go, can't go into the city of Melbourne with a truck tractor with a semi-trailer. That's the rule. PBS. And the reason for that is because you've got the off-tracking of the trailer. So as you know, with a semi, you've got quite a wide off-tracking and you'll flatten a stop sign and whatever you try to travel past. So that was the rule. The PBS concept came past and they said, we don't care what the vehicle looked like as long as it's got an off-tracking uh, much narrower than that conventional vehicle. So they put a steering back axle in. So now you can go into the city of Melbourne with a PBS vehicle with a steering back axle. Problem solved. So that is, that's what uh, PBS is all about. And now I just want to touch a little bit on what PBS have meant for us. This is actual figures. We, in 2005, we're doing three and a half million tons by rail. Now, last year, we did 1.41. Okay, that's granted. Mondi was during shutdown. So we should have done about 1.7 million tons. We are literally at half of what we used to do by rail. And the reason for that is just Transnet is, is failing us. Um, as, as you just need to read the newspapers. They're failing us everywhere. So 1.7 million tons had to, is going on road now. That should be on rail. Because timber is a very, very rail-friendly commodity. It's not like a reefer where, that you've got to keep cool, et cetera. Timber you can stack on a depot and you can keep it there for a couple of weeks. It's not the end of the world. We run 365 days right, right all, all year round. So it's very good for rail, but still rail has uh, dumped us. That difference had to be picked up. The average lead distance in the forest industry is 125 kilometers. Our lead distances from Petra Tief to Richards Bay is 350 kilometers. So it's three times as much. So half of the cost of getting a stick of timber into a mill in Richards Bay is made up um, by transport cost, half of it. So a farmer who grew timber for 20 years, sent it to Richards Bay, and half of his income goes to transport, which is ridiculous. Rail is around uh, 20%. But moral of the story is PBS has saved us there to a massive extent. It, it allowed us to stay at least competitive because we compete on the international market. Um, the bulk price is quoted in dollar, so like gold, et cetera. It's a, it's a dollar denominated uh, uh, price there. Then just a couple of last things. There. As I've mentioned, transit strategy, they've now released uh, a document a while back, to, uh, about two weeks ago, to say what is their key commodities. Timber is not one of them. So we're very afraid that as of 1st of April, we might not get any service from Transnet. That is the reality of the matter. We don't know. And all they're going to slap us with such massive increases that will make road transport more efficient than anyway. Our mills are geared up to take 50% by road and 50% by rail. So we are boot and all in with Transnet. We'd like to stay there, but it is very, very difficult. Um, also, there were damages to the infrastructure, as you know, with the, the rain that we've had uh, last year. The South Coast Line, the, I think it was the Ifafa, uh, bridge washed away. Uh, they haven't even started repairing that. So at the moment, Sapi Cycle takes about 8,500 tons of timber per day. And uh, all of that is going by road. And again, PBS helps us a, a massive amount to keep that cost under control there. And then Paul will talk about this a little bit more. But the safety uh, associated with PBS vehicles. I've, uh, the other day I was driving with Bert Koenig, who's a driver trainer. And uh, he does driver training on these PBS vehicles. And he said, one of the largest ones is in the forest industry is one of the most uh, stable vehicles he's ever driven. And uh, you'll see later from Paul's presentation why that is. It's a, it's a fantastic design. It also alleviates congestion, where if you can carry 50 tons versus 38, there's much less uh, um, trucks on the road there. And then lastly, the regulation of, uh, of PBS. When I manage those 20 PBS trucks and 60 conventionals, 50% of my time went into PBS and 50% in the conventionals due to the regulation of PBS and what you need to have in place. And um, I've got to take my hat off to, to Chris and, and his colleague, um, Shane Mulwood, for the, the focus that they put on it. We couldn't, you couldn't bat an eyelet without them knowing what it is. You can't go off route. Your, your driver hours are monitored. Your driver shifts are monitored. Everything is monitored with a magnifying glass, which is fantastic. 
So our accidents were much less. Everything was just, there was no, nothing negative, I could say, about operating those PBS vehicles. Everything was, uh, was positive. And so it's great. That regulation needs to stay there. And PBS is integrally coupled with RTMS. If you don't have a management system like RTMS, it'll be, it'll be uh, uh, how can I say, it'll be stupid to allow everybody to, to operate PBS vehicles. They need to be able to conform to a high standard. Um, that RTMS provides. Right, and so I think I've made up a bit of time that your video have taken. Right, so thank you very much. I don't know if there'll be any. Thank you so much, Francho. Hopefully you can stay for the questions and answers just now. Um, very informative presentation. Thank you very much for sharing with us a concerning story, shall we say that. Um, ladies and gents, to get the agenda up here, we're now going to request um, Carly from Unitrans. Just get there. Carly Fentus, she's the executive corporate strategy and marketing, Unitrans supply chain solutions, and also a gold sponsor of the Transport Forum. And Carly is going to talk to us uh, about RTMS at Unitrans, a systems approach. Thank you, Carly. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Harry. Just checking whether you can see my screen yet. Excellent. Thank you, mm -hmm. Carly. You can continue. Fantastic. Thank you, Harry. And thank you again for, for having me. Um, I must say, I feel like I'm an extremely privileged uh, audience and I have a, a bit of FOMO for not being there in person. Um, and also Carly, sorry to start, interrupt. Uh, Carly, sorry to interrupt. Can you speak closer to the mic? There is a bit of a, a audio problem. Right, Leah. Is that better? That is better, yes. Right, let me just get close to, <laughs> to the mic. Now, I was just saying, I have a talk about nostalgia and a FOMO for not being there in person. Um, Mr. Adrian Pantona was the first one to introduce me to RTMS, so I'm, I'm very sad that I'm not with you guys there today. Um, but yeah, just happy to be here and uh, to share a little bit about how we implement RTMS at Unitrans and what it means for us as an organization. So kicking off the presentation, um, just what I'll cover is just talking about the standards. I won't go into it in detail. I believe that's been covered by Zolovix and by JC Editors in a lot of detail, which is absolutely fantastic. I'll share why RTMS is so important for us and then how we implement it. Carly, sorry, Carly. Sure. Carly, sorry to interrupt. No, the audio is deteriorating badly. We, we actually can't hear what you're saying. There's no plan we can make on this stage. Maybe we can get uh, uh, Abdul um, please to present and then get you again. Sure. Let me see what I can do with the mic this side. Okay. Thanks, Carly. Sorry about this. No, not at all. All right. Ladies and gents, let's then uh, take uh, Mr. Abdul Kamda. He's the manager, decarbonation and drive to zero. KDG Logistics is going to talk about decarbonization of road freight and the path to net zero. Thank you, Abdul. Okay, what I'll do is I'll share it. I'll share it from that side. Yeah, I think it's just fine. I'll, I'll just try and share it from, from the other PC. So in the meantime, you can start talking and then I'll bring it up soonest. So a few years ago, I was preparing for an event, something like this, and 
the question came to mind, what is the CO2 impact of what I do? And I started looking into the calculations. I did some work at that time with the Smart Freight Center in the Netherlands, and they had a thing called GLEC 2.0, which is an international standard. It's like a hundred and some odd page document. And working through this document, I realized that for every liter of diesel you burn in a truck, there's 3.24 kilograms of CO2. So an average long haul truck running from Durban to Johannesburg using 300 liters of diesel will emit about 972 kilograms of, diesel, of, of CO2. Now that's about one ton. So my fleet is 85 trucks strong, all long haul. So that's 85 tons of CO2 per day. Now that realization to me was massive. It prompted me to look at, A, is it the right thing to do? And B, can something be done about it? So my emissions is, is roughly around 82 tons per day. And that was going back about, probably about five or six years ago. Uh, around, I think it was around 2015 when I came to this realization. Next slide. So I was born in 1966. You may not believe that, but, um, and in 1966, the CO2 in the atmosphere measured 321 parts per million. Next slide. Last year, we had reached 421 parts per million. Now, that's about a one-third increase in my lifetime alone. So I think the reality is that it's dawning upon us that our generation caused this problem. The last 40, 50 years or so is when the largest proportion of man-made CO2 has entered the atmosphere. So it's roughly 50% increase in man-made CO2 in the last 50 years alone. Next slide. So, next slide. So if you, if you look back in the, in the data that NASA has got, for roughly 800,000 years, the CO2 in the atmosphere has more or less approximated 200 to 220 parts per million. But from, from the early 1900s, it just went straight up. And that's simply because of the Industrial Revolution and cars and trucks. So the, the automotive industry. Next slide, please. So if you have to look at the freight problem uh, from a CO2 perspective, long haul, roughly a ton a day per truck. Short haul is roughly around 300 kilograms per day per truck. And then you've got refrigerator, which adds another about 200, 250 kilograms per day. So our industry, road transport, is, is, a, is a massive violator of people's right to fresh air, to clean air, to a clean, healthy environment. Next slide, please. I work for a company called KDG Logistics. And I represent an organization, Transport Action Group, which is an advocacy group towards lower CO2 emissions. My name is Abdul Kamda, and my speciality is decarbonization and the path to net zero as it relates to road transport. Next slide, please. So what I've, what I've developed is uh, three short learning programs, the one in uh, entrepreneurship in road transport. The other is green transport part one, which is decarbonization, and then green transport part two, which is the path to net zero. Uh, I, I'll be leaving early today, immediately after the presentation, actually, because I'm presenting the green transport uh, to a large group of, of operators. It's a three-day workshop in Tanzania, uh, starting on Monday. So next slide, please. So the aim of the, the green transport workshop is, is to, to go through the aspects that are relevant to CO2 in road transport, and that is what is it really about? What is CO2, climate change? What are the impacts of road freight in this regard? And then taking it to a granular level within road transport, how do you calculate your total cost of operations? What is your, your, your CPK elements? Because if you don't understand your CPK elements, then you've got a very poor framework with which to make any changes in your business that has any positive impact. So, so once, we, once we unpack how to, to break up your CPK elements, then we look at what is the profit impact of a CO2 emissions reduction program? And, and here's the crazy thing. People think that reducing CO2 emissions is going to cost you money. But we have proven that if you work towards reducing your CO2 emissions by between 10 and 20%, you can increase your net profit by about 30%, three zero. So within three to six months on an action plan, you can increase your net profit by about 30% and report lower CO2 emissions to your customers. So what that comes down to is developing a credible CO2 reduction strategy, sort of an action plan. You implement that aggressively. And, and 
a large part of it is fuel management and visualization. And then what we get down to is how do you measure the CO2 reduction impact? So it's a reporting structure, how to report the change in emissions. And then at a corporate level, how do you report the increase in profits? So how do you do that calculation? So once you have that framework, then you have a way going forward where you actually end off with a more sustainable business that is environmentally sustainable. Next slide, please. The second part, the part to net zero, focuses on the various technologies that are that are soon to be available to us. So um, we we are at the advent of a whole host of new technologies. Society is moving so fast that it's really difficult to, to catch up with these things. Um, I've been very fortunate. I have strong engagements within Volvo and Scania that allow me to look at transport technology on a very different level. I also am a member of the Heavy Vehicle Transport Technology Conference, which takes me to various parts of the world to, to, to get to grips with the technology changes. So for about 100 years, diesel has been the only thing to buy. So from 1923, when Daimler sold the first diesel heavy truck, to now, that's been the dominant technology. But right now, we have available to us electric, hybrid electric, hydrogen fuel cell, hydrogen combustion engines come as just launched a few months ago at prototype level, hydrogen combustion. We have LNG, CNG, biofuels. We have electric road systems. There's at least eight different technology operation, uh, alternatives on the horizon. So when you're working towards a long-term plan towards net zero, one has to consider all these various options in terms of their pros, their cons, as well as the ecosystems around them. And the great difficulty that most operators are going to have is you can't make these technology changes if you don't know what's your existing technology option costing you. If you don't know your current TCO accurately, with a diesel truck that costs you under 2 million rand, how do you then motivate an electric truck that costs you 6 million rand? Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. So when you're looking at the purchase criteria for new trucks, typically in a diesel truck, it would be the CapEx, can I afford this? What is the OPEX? What is the resale value? What is the weight and payload? Does it suit my, my mission cycle? Reliability, fit for purpose, brand equity and appearance of the truck. So, so these are the simple things we look at when buying a diesel truck. It's not a very difficult decision to take. And it's normally motivated by the economics of the purchase. Next slide, please. When looking at an electric truck, on the other hand, you look at all of that. And then you've got to look at what is the infrastructure requirements to support this. For example, our Volvo electric truck has got a 540 kilowatt hour battery pack. And that demands a charger in excess of 180 kilowatts. So we're looking at a 240 kilowatt charger. The cabling for that charger alone comes to 650,000 Rand. It's a 400 amp, 400 volt cabling. So that is the extent of the problems we're facing. And this is to support one truck that arrives in March. We've got a second truck coming in the second half of the year. So we'll do staggered charging with them. But we expect our fleet to go fully electric by 2040. We're going to need charging infrastructure that Eskom cannot cope with. We need power. But fortunately, there are a lot of initiatives around the country going towards alternative generation. There's co-generation plans. So the electricity problem will be solved over time. The thing is that we've got to be ready for, for, for that evolution to happen. We can't forever sit in the dark of ESCOM and, and, and believe that that is going to hold us back forever. We can't, as an industry, sit back. So at KDG Logistics, we took the decision to be the first in the country to buy the Volvo electric truck. We bought two. So I think it's going to be a big learning curve for us as well as for the industry. And there's a lot that needs to be developed coming out of that. But the reality is every single one of you that will be looking at alternative technologies will need to understand what you need to engage with. I mean, it's hard enough to motivate to the banks to support a 2 million Rand truck purchase. When you go to them and say, I want to buy a truck for 6 million Rand, and it's going to, going to do the same work as the 2 million Rand truck. That's going to be a hard thing for them to swallow. Except if it's Standard Bank. Standard Bank, I've got a plan for you, Kathy. Right. Next slide, please. So, so even if you confine your, your way forward to two different alternatives, one being alternately fueled vehicles and the other one being electrified transport, you've still got in electrification at least five different alternatives. Next slide, please. So, so it's important to understand how do they compare. So this slide was actually released by Volvo only last week where they compared what happens if you take um, 
an electric truck that runs on, on a sustainable energy versus an electric truck that runs off a really dirty coal powered grid and compare that to alternative fuel vehicles in, in um, biofuels. And what they found is that within 100,000 kilometers, the embedded emissions in that vehicle is already uh, taken care of if you charge it on sustainably sourced energy. So if you have a solar farm uh, somewhere in the Karoo and that energy comes into Eskom and you buying that energy, so you can't identify individual electrons, but you can, uh, and you can come to an arrangement where you put in a certain number of kilowatts into the grid to Eskom and you pay a willing tariff and you get that amount of electricity back out again. So if you do it on that basis, then from the first 100,000 kilometers onwards, you are actually net positive in terms of being green. So all this hype about batteries have this burden and embedded emissions and all that, that is all social media hype. There's a strong anti-electric lobby and that's fueled largely by the petrochemical industries. So it's very important for us to look at our moral and ethical framework separated from what the hype is on social media and work in a positive direction based on credible data. Next slide, please. So when looking at the alternative options, some people say, why not hydrogen fuel cells? The city of Durban has got a big hydrogen fuel cell project on the horizon, believing that there's money to be made in a hydrogen economy and jobs to be created in a hydrogen economy. Hydrogen is great. Um, if it wasn't for hydrogen, we'd struggle to have water. But hydrogen is most comfortable when attached to the oxygen atom. So separating the, 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 the water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen is a very expensive thing from an energy point of view. And the tragedy of the hydrogen fuel cell is that if you put 100 kilowatt hours of energy in at the generation point, you only get 22 kilowatt hours available at the wheels. That's what hydrogen costs you in terms of end-to-end -end efficiency. If you put that same energy into an electric truck system, you get 73% at the wheels. So hydrogen works in an environment where you've got a surplus of electricity generation. We don't have that in South Africa. We don't have a surplus of electricity. Next slide, please. Tesla launched an electric truck in concept on stage in about 2015. And back then they promised a whole lot of things that this truck would be capable of doing. That truck has not reached market yet. But there are other service providers like Volvo and Scania that have closer to market projects. The, the Tesla Semi will start reaching first users, I think, in the course of this year. But it set a benchmark for what the truck is capable of. They promised the truck that is capable of doing almost a thousand kilometers, I think, on a single charge. So, so that really requires the next generation of batteries. We're currently still on lithium ion battery technologies. Um, to do this successfully, you need solid state or you need sulfur or, or sulfur or sodium technologies, which will more likely be coming in about the next three to five years. So electric trucks are at its infancy. And the current range of an electric truck, like the Volvo one, for example, is 300 kilometers on a single charge, which means you can run Durban to Johannesburg if you stop the truck to charge it for probably two hours. So it's doable. But in urban short haul, it's exceptional because your cost of fueling that truck is about 20% of the cost of diesel. So in urban short haul environments, the electric truck is going to very quickly reach a total cost of ownership crossover point with the diesel truck. So if you take the total capital cost plus the operating cost of the two vehicles, the electric truck is going to become cheaper fairly soon. So within the next five years, certainly. Next slide, please. So one of the companies that I work with is a company called Legero. They started off in Strasbourg in France and they're now based in the UK and they developed a kinetic energy recovery system that allows you to take a diesel truck and convert it to hybrid operation. So you could fit the electric motor into the drive chain of that, fit in the ultra capacitor bank and the ECU and you'd be able to convert that truck to hybrid and that has already achieved fuel consumption savings of between 16 and 30%. Next slide, please. That was based on the Yasa motor, which is the... Thing on the right and there's an amazing induction motor that fits uh, on the drive line it weighs only 37 kilos but gives you 100 kilowatts so that was the first generation of the of the uh kinetic energy recovery system it's now moved to second generation which is much more reliable motor but weighs three times as much next up so that's what it looks like fitted in the truck next slide please and that is the charge discharge profiles of a kinetic energy recovery system in a truck so I really enjoy looking at that because it gives you an idea of how much of energy we actually waste through braking activity in a truck. So in, in a lot of trucks, 
you waste energy every time you hit the brake and every time you use a retarder. So with kinetic energy recovery systems and hybrid systems, you'll be able to recover that energy. Even in the electric trucks, every time you hit the brake, the truck goes into region and recharges the batteries. So there's going to be a lot of stuff that we're going to have to learn and teach drivers to improve the amount of energy they recover. So that will change the efficiency you get in your electric trucks going forward. Next slide, please. So this is a project that I led uh, in 2018, where we built an electric motor for a truck in Johannesburg. So we designed this motor, we, we assembled it, we built it from scratch. We cut the metal on a lathe, awesome. And it was to, to develop some of the competencies locally in the um, design and manufacture, but also to understand the complexities of it. So the scale of the motor industry in South Africa isn't sufficient to support an electric vehicle build from scratch at this point will be there in about 10 years time, but it allows me to get to the fundamentals of the technology so that we can build the ecosystem to support it and we understand what we need to do to support those vehicles. Next slide, please. This is a vehicle that we at KDG Logistics uh, had built in France. We're the first electric car carrier company in the world. So this is the axle system on the lower electric car carrier. It was built for us. And it's amazing. I mean, even the Japanese, Hino came to see us to look at this because they could not believe that here in South Africa, we had the first one in the world. So that is an electric axle, a 32 kilowatt hour motor. It's a kinetic energy recovery system that fits on the trailer and it allows the trailer to manage its own energy demand. So every time you apply the brake, it recovers the energy from braking and every time you accelerate, it gives you that in going forward. Next slide, please. So the nice thing about hybrid or the CURS systems is that they can be retrofit on existing technologies. So, so you can actually, in principle, fit it to a trailer or to a truck tractor and develop a hybrid combination. Next slide, please. This is the electric road system. So this is promoted by Scania and Siemens. It's in prototype test in various parts of, of Europe. And I think there is one project in the United States. They've, we've given them access to our fleet telematics and they've looked at using this in South Africa. The N3 corridor is ideal for this. What this would do is it would allow you to have an electric truck with a very small battery. So instead of wanting to get a 300 kilometer range on your battery, you could get maybe a 50 kilometer range. So you'd stay on a corridor connected to the uh, catenary overhead lines and you'd leave the corridor to do your delivery and you join it again. So you charge while you're on the corridor, but you have energy on the vehicle to get you off the corridor for first mile, last mile deliveries, which reduces the cost of that truck tremendously. The only problem is when Eskom shuts down, they stop. <laughs> right yeah so 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 that may be a challenge right from a south african perspective right yeah no so so i was i was chatting to the guys so this project is run by cambridge university and i was chatting to to, to david sibon and, and and he could not believe that people will steal the electrical cables he was like no they can't no yes they can so so some of the challenges that we face around these projects is quite novel in the in the, in the global stage right next slide please so in 2018, these were the prototype projects that were happening in the world, right? So this was all there was at the prototype level. There was less than, less than 50 trucks were, were in test in various projects. That was in 2018. Next slide, please. And this is where we are. Um, this is about, I think, 2021, um, sorry, 2020, where Volvo showed the first go-to-market uh, um commercially available trucks in Europe. Next slide, please. And this is where we are in 2022. They're ready to be exported all around the world. And I drove the Volvo electric truck in Gothenburg in October last year, that we, we, after we placed the order for the first one. Next slide, please. Next slide. So Alke Hoekstra did, did the study which, um, which promised that the battery electric vehicle would become cheaper to operate than a diesel vehicle. So if you look at this, is it better to do it? Yeah, yeah. So, so this is the total cost per kilometer on a battery electric vehicle as compared to the uh, diesel vehicle as compared to a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. Um, and he believed that we would reach this crossover point by 2025. So he did the study in 2018. So it's very difficult to predict these things with any accuracy. And I think we probably will reach that point somewhere around 2028 or 2030, where it will be cheaper per kilometer to operate an electric truck. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I think looking at the alternate solutions, it's very important to figure out what are the alternatives, what, are, what alternatives are applicable to what we do, 
what makes sense, what can we actually support? And then we have to pick a direction and we've got to go with that. There are people already who are using LNG and CNG. Um, there are people who have experimented with biofuels, but all of these are early stage projects. The industry will start moving in large numbers once we hit the European bands, which will start around 2030, 2035. So, so there's a big wave coming. We need to start preparing for this. Next slide, please. So my focus is, is on the, the gap years. So if we understand that electric trucks and the other solutions will start scaling into the market from around 2030 or 2035, what do we do with our fleet emissions between now and then? I mean, any one of you probably has trucks of somewhere between five, 10 units to about 100, 500, maybe even 1,000 units in operation. So if you take that number that I went through where you know, a local truck would give you about 300 kilograms of CO2 per day and a long haul about a ton, that's a lot of CO2. If someone opened a factory on your front doorstep and dumped all that CO2 in the atmosphere or even dumped trash to that tonnage, you'd be pretty pissed off. Sorry for the language, ladies. You'd be pretty upset with this, right? But yet we allow our fleets to do this. Our children are going to hold us accountable because they're going to do these calculations in school. And they're going to come home and say, Dad, you messed up. And I'm going to have to clean up your shit. You know, that's a reality, right? Our grandkids. Might, well, I don't have grandkids yet. But yeah, no, there's a lot of steps to go before there. But anyway, so, so those of you that have grandkids, right? Your grandkids are going to come. We're doing an assignment on the environment. And we've discovered that your business does this. And the, the, the stuff that's all in the atmosphere was like put there in your lifetime. So how do we fix this? They're going to hold us accountable. Absolutely. But they've got no respect for the money you bring home, but they will hold you accountable for the other stuff, right? So when have you ever had your child say, Dad, thank you for bringing in your paycheck? Not a chance. Not my son, definitely, right? But he will hold me accountable for his birthday present. And why does he have this kind of phone or not that kind of phone? Right. But our kids are born into the age of activism. Right. And social media pushes them in a direction where they believe that they can hold us accountable. And in a sense, they should hold us accountable because we're going to walk away from this problem. Right. So we're not bearing the problem. The problem will bury us. But we leave a legacy. But we can choose what kind of legacy to leave. And taking the, the moral and ethical uh, argument to one side, there's an economic argument for decarbonization. And that really is something that drives most businesses. We all want to make more money. We should wake up in the morning and say, I want to clean up the planet. But most of us don't do that, right? Most of us thinking, okay, I need to change my car. I want to buy a new handbag, you know, that kind of stuff, right? And there's money in this. We can generate 30% more profit. Next slide, please. So some of the good news stories. Trailer Sol in Durban have done trailer electrification where they fitted solar panels on trailers. And the next thing they're working on is electric refrigeration. So that would largely, sorry, no time. No time. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Yep. So there's a lot of stuff that we need to attend to to get electric trucks going, and and there's a lot that we need to deal with, but we're working on that. So I have meetings this afternoon even with the Department of Transport around trying to promote electric trucks. Next. So one of the problems is that in Europe, electric trucks, for example, have one ton, two tons of extra load allowance. And we don't have that legislation in South Africa, which means that the current electric trucks, which are three tons heavier, will have diminished load capacity. So we're trying to get past that obstacle with DOT. Next slide, please. So this is some of the information that came out of the early electric truck projects in Sweden. And it gives us uh, opportunity to actually take the trucks way beyond the 300 kilometer range that they're currently doing in these trucks. Um, they, they hardly use any of their battery simply because they use a charger during the day. Next slide, please. And that's me. I drove the electric truck, so it's real. At the top is Vera, which is an autonomous truck. It has no cab for the driver. It doesn't need a cab. It drives itself. So that was Vera about four years ago. And this was me with an autonomous shuttle bus, which had a, a thing just for safety's sake. Back then in 2016, they were not sure that the vehicle could drive itself. Now it can. That one does. And this was the one that I drove. Thank you so much. Abdul, thank you so much for an exciting presentation. Um, I'm not too sure about that Ottoman is driving on this stage. 
but uh, we're looking forward to the future anyway. But thank you very much. We're quite sure that we would like to engage with you in the panel discussion. Let me just hear Carly Fenter. Um, how's the sound doing on the stage? Let's test it. Uh, Harry, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Great. I've uh, <laughs> tried alternative technologies, uh, following example there. <laughs> Um, let yeah. me quickly let me quickly properly introduce you quickly sure. uh, again for those who've joined and so on. So we're going to have Carly Fenter. She's the executive corporate strategy and marketing, Unitrans Supply Chain Solutions. She's going to talk about RTMS at Unitrans, a systems approach. Thank you, Carly. Thank you so much, Harry, and yeah, hoping we uh, have all the technology sorted out this time around. Um, and just, yeah, what a fantastic and fascinating presentation there. Um, I yeah, look forward to engaging with you uh, in the future. Um, just leading into, I'm, I know, conscious of time, Harry, so I'm going to try and go through my pack quite quickly. Um, as I mentioned, uh, just in terms of the, the content, I'll just briefly touch on the standards and why RTMS uh, from an Unitrans perspective, um, why we believe it's a systems approach and how we implement it in our organization. I'll briefly touch on PBS. I know Paul Nordingham is also going to talk about that and the benefits at the end of the day. So just who we are as an organization, Unitrans is a supply chain and logistics service provider who I think most of you know. Uh, we operate across 10 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. We have more than 100 depots and we travel 10 million kilometers per annum and have over 9,000 employees. So quite a big scale and reach. Um, and when we start talking about standards and best practice, when your business reaches scale and complexity to, to this effect, it becomes absolutely imperative and pertinent to have those standards and best practices in place. Um, as a transport operator and, and logistics provider in South Africa, we are, we are increasingly operating in an environment where we're seeing a deterioration of the rule of law. Um, Oliver mentioned in his pre presentation that, you know, we're facing, in a lot of cases, a lack of enforcement. And there was a lot of mention today around the fly-by-nights and operators that are taking chances with overloading, that are pushing payloads at the cost of safety. Um, and they may not be performing the required preventative maintenance. They're not ensuring their drivers are taking the necessary rest stops. And there's also these pockets of criminal behavior. Um, Nico Duplessis mentioned this morning instances where cargo theft is rough and uh, as a result of cloned vehicle and shipping documents, etc. So we're operating in this very difficult and challenging environment. And we're seeing an increasing number of crashes and incidents. We, all of us are uh, talk about the, the tanker incidents that we've been seeing or other incidents involving heavy vehicles. And the environment that we're operating in, the road conditions are deteriorating and load shedding is causing havoc with our traffic lights um, that are often out of order. And that also means that root risk assessments are not always adequate or accurate from one day to the next. So in this environment, it's absolutely critical and crucial for us to really take responsibility for our role in promoting and ensuring road safety and risk management and ensuring that we ourselves have all of the controls in place and that we are com uh, compliant and following regulations. And it's for this reason that we as an organization have embraced RTMS as a standard amongst other standards, ISO standards and squash, et cetera. Um, but it allows us RTMS specifically to identify those elements and variables that are impacting road safety, that are impacting road conditions. And we really uh, uh, subscribe to these elements of loading control, of having the correct safety and compliance measures in place, linked to maintenance, risk management, um, and then our driver wellness and driver training and skills development. And all of these elements underpinned by sufficient processes, procedures, records, documents, and, and continuously monitoring them and measuring them for their effectiveness. Um, I recently was exposed to a paper written by a professor of psychology um, at the University of Manchester. 
And it speaks about a person versus a systems approach. Um, often when incidents happen, these, this person approach that happens, uh, we blame the individual. Did the driver make a mistake? Did he fail to brake? Was he speeding? Was he not paying attention? And what this paper suggests is that we need to look at the conditions under which an individual is working. The condition of the roads, the potholes, the broken traffic lights. Was that driver threatened by looters, as an example? And so what this paper suggests is that a systems approach um, takes the focus away from the individual's origins of error, and it actually sees it doesn't isolate, it, it isolates the unsafe acts from the system context. Um, so what I'm saying is that although we have to keep our drivers accountable, there are, after all, professional drivers, we often have to look at what are those conditions around the driver that potentially cause the error and the incident. And so we have to look at why did the mistake happen? We all make mistakes and, and sometimes the best people make mistakes, but we have to understand where do we evaluate, how do we evaluate for, for blameless and blameworthy actions? And so what they describe in terms of the systems approach is the need to put defenses, barriers, safeguards in place in order to avoid the mistake from happening in the first place. And what it says is high technology systems have many defensive layers, whether they're engineered, whether it's processes that are dependent on people, whether it's certain controls. Um, but those layers have to in, be in place in order to avoid the error taking place um, in the first place. And it's likened to a Swiss cheese, if, if I can put it that way, or layers of Swiss cheese. If one of the layers has a hole, for example, the driver is tired or maintenance wasn't done or the road was in a poor condition or the vehicle was overloaded, all of those holes in terms of those layers of defense start lining up and suddenly you have a straight line arrow to a fatal possibly incident or at least a high risk situation. And so the examples that are given are these high reliability organizations like the Navy or air traffic control where they become absolutely preoccupied by the possibility of failure. And they anticipate errors happening and they then build in layers of defense. And I believe from, from this paper that we can learn from these examples and from these high reliability organizations. And so for us, from, a, from an organization point of view, RTMS, the standard, is likened to our systems approach, our layers of defense against these issues happening and against the mistakes and against errors happening. So to minimize risk, um, and to ensure compliance, to increase productivity, and to improve our impact or reduce negative impact, um, reduce overloading, reduce um, uh, fuel consumption, and improve carbon emissions. Um, that is what this RTMS framework really brings for us. So maybe just to jump into how we implement these elements in our organization, um, the loading control elements, I think it's so critical to understand not just loading, but understand your fleet inventory and understand the various specifications, the various payload configurations, and then optimize according to that. Um, and that becomes so much easier when it is supported by technology, by reporting, by trend analysis. Um, a key part of a loading control is the effective reporting um, of loading and uh, underloading um, in certain cases. Um, and this constant monitoring and, and um, focus really provides benefits for the organization in the long run. From a safety and compliance point of view, um, with a fleet size um, that is significant, we have to have centralized operational control. And that centralized operational control is supported by technology. Our operational excellence center uh, is based in Kenilworth and Cape Town, and it really provides a centralized point where we can focus on where our vehicles are, how our drivers are behaving. And this is really where technology has really made a massive difference in our lives, allowing us to understand what 
um, driver be driver behavior is like seeing trends we can identify where drivers are recurringly having fatigue issues um, and in those instances we've been able to identify drivers that have chronic illnesses that haven't been diagnosed necessarily and to treat them um, and to assist them in that process um, it's also elements like um, pre-collision notifications, understanding hotspots of criminal activity and being able to route our drivers away from those areas in terms of risk mitigation um, and to manage by exception, but also to have early warnings of critical events. And that's really made a massive difference in our lives. Um, and I think a key part of this is because we have the reporting, we have the ability then to train and to develop and to coach and to guide um, and to really work with our drivers to improve their behavior and ultimately uh, reduce risk on the road. Um, from a driver wellness perspective, I think goes without saying, we've been speaking about driving hours and monitoring driving hours, but also monitoring medicals and recurring medicals and understanding when they need to be, be renewed and rechecked. Um, fatigue monitoring, it's so critical to, to keep the, at, at an executive level a focus on that. All of our operational executives track the fatigue um, alerts in our business on an ongoing basis, and it's reported at the most senior level and that's the degree of focus that it must receive and then the wellness support and initiatives and campaigns that we drive um, and ensuring good nutrition particularly with long distance drivers that often stop at rest stops and tend to have sugary drinks and fatty foods and that results in energy spikes but then fatigue straight after um, and really creating an awareness and educating on the importance of good nutrition is so critical our driver training is really one of the things that we uh, pride ourselves on. Um, we have various classrooms and various um, modules that we, we uh, coach our drivers on to ensure competency. Uh, we do both classroom and in-cab training and the various elements that we cover links to direct control of the vehicle, which as if that's not in place, could have harmful impact to people and other road users. It's also about how you handle your equipment and fuel consumption, because that has an impact on the environment. And then also around cost management and management of the assets, because that obviously has a cost impact. And then training around brand uh, pre presence and representing us as a brand. It's such an important part as well because there's reputation linked to that and then legal compliance ultimately. And our classrooms all follow these various um, training modules and we really pride ourselves in having one of the, the, the groups of most well-trained and professional drivers out there. There's a lot of detail here on our driver training, so I'm going to skip over a few of these, Harry, um, just to save on some time. But what we have seen as a result of all of these various interventions and training and um, focus on wellness of our drivers, we've definitely seen an improvement in driver behavior. And again, because we have our tracking and our monitoring and our reporting, we're able to see where do those events happen, why we can track following distance, we can understand when there are particular events around a driver potentially being unbelted or making a U-turn. Those are results in investigations and um, incident um, uh, investigations and coaching and correct of actions that follow. Um, it's so important to, to have the buy-in of your staff in terms of this process. And, um, and over the years, I believe the Unitrans drivers have really embraced um, all of the technology, the onboard technology, um, you know, Nikki said that sometimes that can be quite invasive, but really understanding that that is there for, for safety and for keeping them safe. Um, and the training and the coaching is really to make sure that we get them back home to their families. Um, and we've really seen a massive improvement in driver behavior over time. Um, and then briefly to touch on PBS, um, I know Paul's going to talk about it. And uh, we heard from the forestry um, representatives. It was so fascinating to, to listen to the history of it. Um, but essentially, 
Uh, we believe that uh, from an RTMS perspective and a PBS perspective, there's massive opportunity in terms of payload optimization and productivity. Um, the use of these new technologies and configuration really allows for safer, more productive vehicle combinations. Um, and that in turn, creates less damage to the environment, to the road surface, the highway infrastructure. Um, and yeah, we, we really subscribe to this. The Unitrans, the PBS philosophy is embedded in Unitrans. We have a number of these units in our mining sector, agriculture environment, as well as the petrochemical sector. Um, I've shared here some of the various configurations that we've had in our mining division over the years. The configurations change and certain customer operations require different um, elements, but essentially at the end of the day, the focus is on productivity, but at utmost safety at the same time. Um, and, and really, RTMS provides the framework to, to support these configurations. Um, and then uh, in terms of the petroleum division, our fuel division, um, this PBS tanker is, is really also, I believe, one of the most stable combinations on the road. Um, and, and really, it, it brings about a lot of payload maximization. Um, it, it's in terms of off-tracking has performed really well. Um, and uh, similarly to the petroleum environment, we have a number of PBS applications in our agriculture environment and also in our poultry environment for the transportation of animal feed as well as um, live birds. So coming through to the benefits, um, visible measurable improvements really across our business, we've seen the reductions in harsh acceleration, harsh braking, speeding has come down by 37%, accidents uh, reduced by 58%, fuel consumption improved, and it might seem low at 2%, but across um, the amount of liters that we consume, that is a considerable improvement, um, and critical events reduced by 9%, and the, the list goes on and on. So, so ultimately, to summarize how we see the benefits of RTMS is really governance and compliance benefits uh, around ensuring that vehicles are not overloaded, um, load safety, daily road verification and pre-trip inspections, really enforcing those elements. Um, and then the productivity and commercial benefits we see in the PBS participation, um, also reducing kilometers and trips, creating cost savings for our customers, but also improving our um, uh, competitiveness in the market as a result. And then lastly, uh, but probably most important, is the safety and sustainability benefits, um, reducing incidents, improving um, driver behavior, and just reducing risk on the road ultimately is what we all want to achieve. And, and so at Unitrans, we have this saying, we believe in the power of doing. And I think when, when couple that with RTMS, it's about doing the right thing, um, ultimately, because that saves lives. So thank you, Harry. That was me. I know it was a quick one, but I have a bit of a time constraint as well. Um, so thank you to you and the audience. I don't know if there's any questions. Maybe I, I, I know I'm going to miss the Q&A later. Charlie, thank you so much. This was excellent. Clearly, the big brand Unitrans is perfecting RTMS uh, and uh, to a great extent. So thank you very much. Uh, let's not waste time. Is there anybody in the audience who'd like to ask Carly a question? Carly, it seems that you are free. You're free to go. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you, you so, so much, much Harry. Carly. And yeah, thank you for having me once again and have a great rest of the afternoon. You too. Thank you so much, Carly. Take care. Thanks for sharing. So while Harry's doing that quick one, the question was some although it's possible to be given a wet bottle for example um ASAP, so at your presentation what is the average carbon emission measurement per day for a couple application per day carbon emission who said that you are so on the money fantastic it's yours okay and then from current presentation what does Ravi lighten RTMS to and something that she's learned from a her presentation, something that she said, Artemis is very similar. Right. 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 Right.
I've seen it in the room. That's it. Well done, young man. Okie dokie. So, so we did everything. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. For fun stuff again. Um, ladies and gents, right. So now we're going to, last but not least, um, right, we're going to have Dr. Paul Nodjinson. Abdul just said to me, you need to run, but if there's any questions for him, you can route it through myself and we'll get it to Abdul. So Dr. Paul Nodjinson is the director of AV Vehicle Transport Technology Africa. Uh, he's going to talk to us about performance-based standards uh, project. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul. Uh, thanks very much, Harry, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's always great for me to present on uh, PBS, and you've already heard quite a bit of it, out of it this morning. Um, I think what's really important for those who don't know about uh, PBS is the, the underlying principles. It's, it does allow for high-capacity vehicles, so longer and or heavier, as you've seen in some of the photographs. But, but, you know, what's behind it? It's not just a matter of putting bigger trucks on the road. I think that's really my, probably the, my most important message uh, for you today. And so I'm going to start with, uh, how do I play these things? Uh, um, it's a couple of video clips just to demonstrate the instability of heavy vehicles. Traveling at, this is uh, 29, 28 miles per hour. So it's not a truck not traveling very fast, and yet it, it rolls over for whatever reason. Um, this is, was in Pine Town a couple of years ago, and admittedly the, the truck is traveling quite fast. I was going to play. So the origin of, of PBS was actually in the United States, where the Federal Highway Administration was very concerned about the approximately 10,000 truck rollovers that <coughs> were happening in the States every year. And so they appointed the University of Michigan to do research on trucks. You know, why are there, why are there so many rollovers? And that was the beginning of a so-called performance-based standards approach. Um, and Canada and New Zealand were, in fact, the first two countries to use that uh, research, the res research findings to apply a different approach to regulating trucks on the road. Then Australia was second, and in fact, South Africa was the fourth country in the world. Um, the prescriptive regulation is what we've been talking about this morning for trucks, for, heavy, for vehicles on the road, is to ensure safety of other road users and protection of the infrastructure. So we have mass limitations, we have dimensional limitations, we have speed limitations, etc. But the, the reality is that with trucks in particular, despite the prescriptive regulation, you still have heavy vehicles on the road that are not very stable. And, in, and with our uh, mass uh, regulations where we allow eight tons on an axle, maximum of eight tons on an axle with single tires, those vehicles do a lot more road damage than uh, with uh, an axles with dual tires at nine tons versus eight tons. So that's a, a shortcoming in our regulation. And that's the case in most countries around the world that trucks that are traveling with single tires loaded to those heavy loads, 56 tons, are actually causing a lot more road wear per ton of payload. So we, we do have shortcomings. And we started, um, Francois mentioned about the start of the project in 2000. Before we established the committee and at the end of 2007 the first vehicles pbs vehicles went on the road um, in the forestry industry and the, the idea of this pilot project was to look at the reduction in roadway using these so-called pbs vehicles uh, what's the extent of reduction in roadway per ton of payload reduction in congestion improved safety performance improved transport productivity reduced emissions 
And also, more recently, we've looked at, you know, the impact of the PBS approach or high capacity vehicles on cross border delays. And in fact, you can, we talk about the ports this morning, you know, the, the queues of trucks at the ports wanting to offload stuff. Richards Bay is a good example. You know, if you've got a high capacity vehicles, you can reduce the number of trucks um, queuing and at Eskom power stations and mines, etc. So I'm going to go through this presentation fairly quickly. I'm aware that uh, time is not on our side, but we developed a strategy um, for implementing this approach in South Africa. And there is a smart truck rules document, which has been updated many times. This version 34 was uh, released in, last, in December this last year. Um, as we come across issues, we develop and in, in, in pre, improve the rules. And it's largely based on the Australian PBS scheme, which was adopted into legislation in 2008. Um, and we have made some modifications to for uh, uh, South African, the South African road environment, but largely it's the, the safety uh, rules are based on the Australian scheme. Um, so basically, so what it what PBS is, is you look at the performance of a vehicle and you set certain limits. So, and this is done largely through computer simulation. You can see on the left hand column, there's certain maneuvers that a vehicle is put through by, through computer simulation, but also field testing can be done. Um, and then on the right hand column are the so called performance standards. So when a vehicle does a, a 90 degree slow speed turn, you can measure things like low speed swept path, tail swing, frontal swing, uh, and then you've got a high speed lane change, you've got a rollover test. And when you do those maneuvers, you measure certain things. And for the vehicle to pass as a PBS vehicle, it must comply with the limits that have been set. Um, so that is really what the performance based standard approach is about. Now, Harry, you might have to turn the volume down because this this is an Australian clip. Just to uh, yeah, that's a standard. Okay, that's a standard truck, truck tractor semi trailer, and you can see there's some off tracking. Right now, off tracking or low speed swift path is something that is a, one of the performance standards. Here, you've got a longer truck. It's also a, a prescriptive vehicle in Australia, and you can see the swift path increases. The third truck is a PBS vehicle, so it's one meter longer than the previous vehicle, but it's been designed to comply with the low speed swept path. So it, you can see the improved performance. Now this fourth vehicle is also a prescriptive vehicle in Australia. It's 25 meters long, but it's got very poor off tracking performance. So you can see how much it cuts into the, and that's a, that's a legal vehicle in Australia. And then the last one is one meter longer. It's a 26 meter vehicle. It's got more articulation points and you can see how well it performs. So that is, that illustrates what we're talking about when we talk about performance standards. It's how does a vehicle perform on the road, even though it might be longer. What's really important from a slow, a low speed point of view is how much space the vehicle takes when it goes around the corner. And that's very important at intersections and at depots, loading zones, etc. And I mean, uh, the SA Breweries and Coca-Cola A double, which is 30 meters long, is a very good example of a longer vehicle that actually performs very well uh, at, a low, at a low speed. Um, and then you've got a uh, high speed transient off tracking. This was the first, one of the first PBS vehicles in forestry. So you can see it's a rigid truck with a drawbar trailer. The one on the uh, left is a, a baseline vehicle and it failed this, it's a high speed lane change, which um, a driver would normally wouldn't do. It's more sort of an emergency type of maneuver. And that, that standard legal vehicle, 56 tons, it failed. And the one on the right is a PBS vehicle is 27 meters long, 67 and a half tons, but it's been designed the position of the hitch, the length of the drawbar, the suspension, things that are not normally regulated by the, the Road Traffic Act uh, can be played around with so that the vehicle, even though it's longer and heavier, it passes. This is now a high speed uh, performance standard. Um, I think I've got one more. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, in November, we did some field testing at Gerotech. And this is a, 
uh, again, this is the high speed lane change maneuver. We had bladders in a side tippet. And you can see how the, you can see how the bladder, we were trying to model how to com, uh, model on computer uh, a side tipper with bladders in, because they, they can use that on the return leg to transport diesel, typically from a port to a mine. Um, and so there's, you can do field testing um, to, to simulate. Uh, it's not a very high offset, but when you're doing 88 kilometers an hour, it's, it's quite, uh, you don't just easily do that. In fact, they not, the driver normally starts off doing that maneuver at 30 kilometers an hour, then he goes at 40 kilometers an hour, then he goes at 50 kilometers an hour, and he slowly um, sort of builds up confidence to do that high speed maneuver. Uh, in some cases, they actually put out riggers on the truck because it, it can, for, for certain types of vehicles, you actually get rollover. And then you don't want the truck to um, actually roll over. And then another very important performance standard, which is applicable to even rigid trucks, short rigid trucks, often fail this, what we call a static rollover threshold. And there you, you have a, a constant radius, a horizontal curve, and you gradually accelerate the vehicle until the lateral forces forces the vehicle to roll over. And that's um, called static rollover threshold. This, in this case, it was it was the SA breweries. The red one is the PBS vehicle, and the blue one, which is superimposed, is the baseline. And the baseline failed. And that's very common around the world that vehicles don't pass this um, static rollover. So now the, the vehicles are gradually increasing speed, and as they increase, the lateral acceleration increases. That one failed at 0.27 g. And the minimum requirement for SRT is 0.35 G, which is a lateral acceleration. And this, now you can see the, the PBS vehicle rolls over at about 0.36 G. And that gives a much better chance of a driver um, avoiding a rollover. If he's got a, a vehicle with a 0.27 G or a 0.26 G static rollover threshold, he's, he's likely to roll over. If he's like you saw that video clip going around the corner, not that fast, and yet the truck rolls over. Um, so this is, you know, it's really to do with fundamental design of a vehicle. And again, we did some testing at Jurotech uh, with the same vehicle. And to, to, to do the static roll of a threshold, you use what's called a tilt table. And, and here we are doing the tilt table test. And there are chains on the, on the table to what? stop the vehicle from actually falling over. It's a bit scary. But then you, you measure that angle. And that angle can be related to the static rollover threshold, which is that 0.35 G. And in fact, for dangerous goods materials like diesel or any dangerous goods or passengers, that requirement is actually 0.4 G, which is even more uh, stringent. So, so this vehicle had to pass a 0.4 G static rollover threshold because it would be transporting a diesel in this, you know, if it's transporting ferrochrome or platinum, well, that's not that's not a dangerous uh, good. Okay. Um, sometimes traffic impact assessments are required for certain parts of the route, typically what we call the first mile or the last mile. So for longer vehicles, like a 30 meter vehicle, the province might require a traffic impact assessment where you look at the route, uh, you simulate the vehicle going through the intersections to make sure it can safely um, maneuver, and this was a in Pumalanga for a Premier FMCG uh, for bread. Uh, that's where they want to transport higher volume. Now uh, the link between the PBS and RTMS is that when we started the project, we we recognised that for operators to run these high capacity vehicles, it's absolutely essential that the fleets are properly managed. And you heard what Carly was saying, and and some of the earlier presentations. So. All the PBS operators in South Africa now, those fleets are required to be RTMS certified for a minimum of six months. Um, and that's to make sure that the speeding is under control, driver hours, driver training, driver health, all those things, uh, servicing of vehicles, tires, brakes. Um, you, you know, if, you, if you've got um, these high capacity vehicles that go up to 90 tons, 72 tons, 83 tons, if the brakes aren't working or if the driver's speeding at 100 or 120, it really increases, it would increase the risk greatly. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, th this is, uh, uh, you see at the bottom there, uh, September 22, it's now 800 
It's now about probably 900 PBS vehicles around the country. I actually got updated statistics last night or early this morning, and I just haven't didn't update the slide. But we probably now uh, 500 million PBS vehicle kilometers, and we get we collect baseline monitoring data so we can do good comparisons uh, on the benefits, which I'll show you in a minute. The most the greatest adoption up to now has been in forestry, in mining, especially in the coal industry, and then fuel. Uh, Carly showed you the Unitrans fuel quad. I must say that uh, Unitrans have been almost one of the pioneers in coming up with good uh, or innovative designs for PBS vehicles right from the start when we started the project, especially in the mining sector. Um, these are some examples of uh, the top two. Francois showed you the, the one at the top, uh, the longer PBS vehicle in timber, and then we've got side tippers uh, that have become very common especially in Mpumalanga, and then transporting um, mining product to the ports. And the unfortunate thing is, you know, the, the, the problems that Transnet have had in the last, especially in the last year, um, has resulted in huge increases in number of trucks on the road, which is not really sustainable. Um, and then there you've got the SA Brewery's 11 axle uh, PBS vehicle. That's what we call an A-double. Uh, and there's a few more. There's the fuel quad that Carly showed earlier. There's a bioarticulated bus that's operating in Mbombela and Elspreit area. Very, very um, successful. The, the crash rates of that bioarticulated bus, which is 27 meters long, is um, around five crashes per million kilometers. They've been running it for probably close to 10 years now. And you can see the bus train, the crash rate is 9.1 crashes per million and the solo buses which are the rigid buses it's 9.5 crashes per million so you can see the the bioarticulated buses which can carry uh, 135 seated passengers have got a, a crash rate that's almost half the other buses um, and then this was uh, quite this was the biggest uh, uh, pbs vehicle with the unitrans at um, richards bay minerals and they were running this triple, the, the top vehicle, which is not a PBS vehicle, under permit for quite a number of years. Notice the long draw bars. Um, and then they applied to the KZN Department of Transport to increase the payload. That bottom one, which is uh, 42 odd meters long and 185 tons combination mass. And um, there you can see now rearward amplification. The one on the left has failed completely, the rearward amplification. It's another performance standard. Whereas the one on the right, although it's got uh, four trailers, it's been designed so that when it does this high-speed maneuver, it's just a lot more stable. Um, this is a re more recent road train operating in PE, and that's from the stockpile, manganese stockpile near Kucha, uh, hauling uh, manganese ore to the ships, to the harbors of Kucha and Port Elizabeth. Um, and those are special containers that are picked up by cranes. They open at the top because uh, when the ship comes in, they want to load 70,000 odd tons as quickly as possible because the wharfage fees are very high. So the, you know, they stockpile the, the manganese that comes from the Northern Cape. And then um, they've had now recently approval to run this road train on, on a short distances from the stockpile to the port. And then it's Kucha and Port Elizabeth Harbour. So to load the cargo under the container train into the harbour. Yeah, at the stockpile. Uh, sorry, you load what? The stockpile is okay. Just outside Kucha, close to Kucha. Okay. ships under the container train. Yes, they pick up those blue containers and, and load it into the ship. It kind of tips on the side and all the manganese falls out. Um, this is a, a road train that's recently started operating in KwaZulu Natal, mainly because of the the, the the Transnet is no longer running timber now from Richards Bay to Sapi Saiko. Am I correct? Yep. So um, rather than putting like 50 more trucks on the N2 to, to try and handle that timber, never mind the problems at the mill where they have, you know, they've got problems with the offloading. Um, this is a much reduced number of trucks to move the same amount of timber. 
And then uh, Carly mentioned uh, some of the, this is a Unitrans Africa first PBS vehicle in Namibia. They also now started running a pilot project. And that's also an A double for transporting salt from the Volvos Bay salt mining to the port, which is an 18 kilometer um, trip. And you can see that for that vehicle, the, the road wear or road damage is 12% is less. And they've gone from um, 80 trips per day to 44 trips per day. So it's a big improvement in terms of the congestion on the roads. Um, I'm gonna skip through the car carrier a bit uh, because of time. And then I just wanted to show you the Coca-Cola A double, which is the same as the, um, and Harry, you probably need to turn the volume down here. Uh, this was their launch in Bloemfontein. Um, okay, the volume sounds like the volume's off. Um, it's a Volvo 610, and uh, I can have a little bit of music. Um, and this has got steer tires, steer axles at the back. The tridem, the back axle of the tridem of both trailers is a steer axle to pass the performance standard of low speed swept path. So because it is a longer vehicle, so normally it would take up more space. So that's where the innovation comes with these PBS vehicles. You can do things to make the vehicle pass all the performance standards. And you'll just see the last bit as he goes onto the N1 at the interchange in Bloemfontein. Just watch here. This is a 30 meter vehicle. <coughs> you can see it turning now. And that, that low speed swept path is better than a standard 22 meter B double because it's got an extra articulation point and also got steer axis at the back. It actually uh, turns quite nicely. So, you know, these are some of the, sorry. Uh, let's, let's get that, yeah. Now, this is a summary of the savings uh, for the project that I, as I say, I haven't updated this up till the end of December this last year, but the, 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 the percentages have remained more or less the same. So about 26% reduction in trips on average with all the different uh, PBS designs. On average, a 20% savings in fuel, 12% um, on average reduction in road wear, and significantly a 44% reduction in crashes. Um, and just in case you think that figure might be, you know, an error this is these are statistics from australia and they've had a they've measured a 46 percent reduction in major crashes uh the pbs vehicles and you can see here how they've grown um they've now got over 16,000 um pbs vehicles in australia you can see from 2008 how it's accelerated uh, the number of vehicles they've approved um and then just Lastly, the we we as part of the pilot project, we always analyze a baseline vehicle in terms of the performance standards. And as I mentioned earlier, fifty in this case, you can see fifty six percent of the baseline vehicles, which are legal vehicles, fail at least one of the performance standards. So it just shows that, and that's a global kind of phenomena that standard trucks, despite the prescriptive regulations, are not that stable on the road. A lot of them don't comply with, let's say, what we call con uh, good performance standards. So um, that's one of, the, I'd say, the major benefit of of this approach to um, to vehicles. And this one just shows that the three most common failures of the baseline vehicles are all high speed maneuvers. And I showed you two of them. There's the static rollover threshold, the rearward amplification, and then another one is your speed. Uh, your damping coefficient. That's the ones that the baseline vehicles or standard legal vehicles most commonly fail. And this was a study I was involved in, OECD study. And again, this is static rollover threshold. So if, if the result is below that red line, it's a failure. And, and look at all the European, um, these are what we call workhorses. So these are very common trucks in those countries around the world, either Australia, South Africa, Europe, and then North America, Mexico, US. And so you can see there's actually quite a few vehicles, especially in Europe, 
that fail the static rollover threshold performance standard. Um, so really the objective of this project is to try and optimize what's called the heavy vehicle performance envelope. We, want, we don't want to go over, we don't want to go over safety, acceptable safety standards, road wear, but then also environment by reducing emissions. But we want to optimize it because you can't keep building more roads. Traffic's increasing. It's a, big, it's a big problem. And there's just no space and no money to keep building new roads to accommodate all the traffic. So that's really, in a nutshell, what PVS is all about. <laughs> Thanks, Harry. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Yes. Can you kind of take up a seat here at the front? So, ladies and gents, we're going to do a, a panel discussion now. So, can we get the presenters of this uh, second half, Francois? Who's with still available? Oliver? Who else was there of the second half? I think the rest had to leave. And then Adrian is going to kindly moderate for us. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Kathy. So Kathy is going to collect the business cards. The idea of the business cards is that it's uh, for the lucky draw just now, the lucky draws. Um, so you can put in your business card or you can remove this one and put it in a box. So we're going to use it just now when we do the draws. Uh, Adrian, I'm going to grab a camera. I'm going to give you a microphone. Thanks, Harry. Um, okay, thanks everybody for um, joining this workshop today. Um, we'll pose some questions to, to the three guys left over. I know um, Carly's offline and AK is, is off to the airport. So I just want to make one or two comments on their presentations before we get started with these guys. Um, just to say that I think the basics applied by Unitrans is absolutely superb. You can see it's part of the DNA of their business. So you can really see the benefits that has come out of it and the impact is massive. So that was great to see from Kali. Um, AK's presentation, AK, he just does things differently. I mean, he's one of those guys that pushes the envelope all the time. And I think we need guys like him because they're pushing the envelope of trying different types of vehicles is paving the way for the rest of us to follow. We all still struggle. We all still going along with diesel. AK has taken a short lift and he's doing something completely different. Um, so to bring in two big Volvo trucks full electric, hats off to them. For you people that live in Durban, you'll know when those trucks are here. When your lights go dim one night, you know, AK has plugged the trucks in <laughs> with these 600,000 Rand cables, um, but it's needed. <laughs> yeah. But it's absolutely needed. So two, two great presentations. Um, now, from the floor, questions for these three gentlemen up here. Any questions on PBS, RTMS, and forestry? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question is to oh, yeah. My question is to Paul. What uh, what are what impedes the PBA standards from being adopted to be the regulations? Uh, what in in your own words? Okay, that's a fantastic question. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, we, when I was at the CSR until three years ago, and um, we did a PBS evaluation report, in, and it was submitted to the National DOT in October 2020, and up till now, we haven't had a response in terms of the way forward. We've tried a number of times, Forestry South Africa have written letters to the Director General um, and in fact, a number of the provinces have, have tried to stop issuing permits because they say the pilot project's been going long, en long enough. It's time now to make a decision on the way forward. Just hold on, I want to get a prize. Um, so, um, but I'm happy to say that Mavis, who I mentioned earlier, Mavis Mpanga, she and myself wrote a letter in January to the Director General, and now we've actually got a meeting next week. Uh, so hopefully we can make some progress, but 
I would say to answer your question, some of the operators are a bit hesitant because it's still a pilot project. Although the, the concept approvals that are given by the provinces are for five years. So you, you, when you do your PBS project, you, you kind of got at least that guarantee that you'll be allowed, assuming that you're compliant, uh, you'll get five years. And, and all the PBS vehicles that have started operating right from 2007 are still operating. So they haven't stopped them. But uh, that's the that's, uh, answer. Thanks, Paul. So have you got any contact with DOT? Give the number to Paul. <laughs> so there was a question this side. Oh, one answer. Uh, no, just to follow up on that. Um, there's a bit of a disjoint because Transnet doesn't fall under the Department of Transport. It falls under DPE. So these, these two entities should actually fall under the same um, department. Watch the space because uh, you know, there's changes in cabinet coming. But we've had various meetings with Transnet um, about our issues like I've described earlier. And some of the Transnet guys responded saying that PBS is the reason why a lot of volume have left rail. And <laughs> instead of saying thank you to PBS for, for saving industry. So there's this perception. And I don't know if that in the background might play a role in the delay in the acceptance um, by DOT. Harry, there's a question here. Uh, there's another one here in the middle. Yeah, sorry, a quick question. In terms of RTMS, what is the defined hours in terms of uh, fatigue, driving hours and working hours? This is to Oliver. So the, the bargaining council stipulates a maximum of 15 shift hours, and that's what we would uh, also uh, use during the audits. In terms of driving hours, uh, the current proposed regulation is maximum of five hours continuous driving time. So those are the two limits that we would use uh, during the audits. However, we do recommend that each operation consider the risk in the light of the specific route traffic density, and other operational factors that may come into play um, as well. But those are the two uh, minimum requirements we apply. It's, um, it's 15 times six, I think. So it's 90 hours per week, shift hours. OK, that's with overtime, right? Yeah, so, correct. So we, we, the bargaining council stipulation is what we apply as well. Uh, can I address this question to Paul? Um, would the PBS vehicle in any way contribute positively to this nonsense of the nine foot six high container not being technically allowed on the road because of the stability of the rig? Uh, yeah, another good question. Um, when I interacted with various people 10 years ago, when, when the first um, concession was given to 4.6 and we recommended that uh, PBS assessments should be done on typical uh, container vehicles uh, with the with the higher con high cube containers and to see what uh, trailers are acceptable from a rollover point of view um, but it was never I think I think that oh, uh, Chris might answer that We've been sort of informed by National Department of Transport that uh, it looks like they are going to ex extend the height to give relaxation for that. Apparently, it's on the minister's desk for signature, but the minister's changed so often. So, Forever. yeah, no. How we understand it, there'll be a relaxation like the double decker bus. Yeah, but that's a National Department. So, I mean, my my personal view would be that. The, the, a, a limit like, for example, of SR static rollover threshold of 0.35 G would should be something that would be would be great to include there. So in Australia, in New Zealand, they've they've regulated the um, static rollover threshold for dairy and timber vehicles, prescriptive. So that's you know any any from a certain date, any vehicles that want to, that carry timber or uh, dairy have to comply with an SRT of 0.35G. And I would say that would be a very good way of trying to improve or reduce crashes with 
containers to say, okay, high cube containers, we sign it off, but there needs to be a check for, because I mean, ultimately you want to keep that center of gravity uh, down. And I mean, in, in other countries, they use four meters or 4.3 meters, and they still carry high cube containers. So it's possible, but we understand that to change the whole vehicle fleet, you can't do overnight. But anyway, I, you know, if we, if you can win both ways if you if you consider SRT in in, in those uh, vehicles. Cool. Any other questions? Yes. You need to be on a mic so the people on TV can hear us. <laughs> Did this, those tests pass? Letters. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm making them. If you want to get my contact details, <laughs> no. Um, look, they, they're being used by different operators in standard trucks. So, so the, hmm? okay, I'm not sure of all the details, but yeah, it could be. Um, the reason for these tests is that the, the company wanted to demonstrate not, not a, as a PBS vehicle, but just as a legal vehicle with a uh, liquid in a, a bladder to see that the stability passes the static road. Like we were just talking about uh, high cube containers. You can use any of the performance standards to check the stability of your vehicle, whatever. You know? And so that was the aim of the test. In terms of the actual legislation, I'm not sure. But this company wanted to, to show that that vehicle with those bladders in can pass the static rollover threshold of 0.4 G, and then also the uh, um, rearward amplification. So two 12 meter I cubes is coming in. Yeah. It could be on but, the cards. Yeah. yeah, that could that could be, but if it's two 12 meters, it would be over length, so then it would have to comply with the performance-based standards. But yeah. it's coming. Well, they are guys who are busy with, yes. with projects at the moment, applications for PBS. That's another hole in the road called rail. Well, you know, if you look at costing, the, the rail, if you can move stuff bulk by rail, you can never compete, use, even using PBS vehicles. The cost, so the, the ultimate for bulk and for products that can move on rail, even containers, the, the cost is by far cheaper if you can do rail. PBS will reduce, it depends on the distances and various things. Yes, no, no, I agree with you, but I'm just saying, like with timber, the example that um, Francois gave, they don't want to move off rail. It's, it's the cheapest. It's the cheapest by far. PBS will be cheaper than standard trucks, but it can't compete with rail for, for specific operations. Yeah, the issue is the short haul at the other end. Yes. Is, is that much better for road oh, than it is for rail? Oh, yeah. Harry, I think another question. Good. Any other questions? <laughs> Chris, are you hungry? Hundred <laughs> percent. Well, thank you, everybody. Who's closing? Me. Okay. Well, Harry. Good. As me. Okay. We want to draw. So, um, so where's Kathy? Yeah. So I'm going to close off now, just to say thanks to everybody for taking the time out, spending the morning. Um, with us regarding all the topics, including, um, I think there was a lot of focus on people today, which was which was great, and some good RTMS presentations. So so thanks for the time, and and if we go away and one company decides to become certified and we save one person's life, then it's been a, a day and a job well done, in, in my opinion. Right. Thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you so much, Adrian. Ladies and gents, let's give this panel a big hand and Standard Bank for hosting us today. <laughs> Do you need me to say more, young Adrian? Okay. Yeah, so so um, just think when I stop talking, we do the lucky draw. So the more you listen, the quicker I speak. No, I'm just kidding. But yeah, I think just in summary, thank you. It was great. We had lots of presentation. Thank you everybody for joining us today. It's really exceptional.
And um, quite rightly so, there's been a lot of focus on, on people. It, it's been awesome. I could even remember also Nikki's uh, presentation. But I think what is, what is for us is very important is that we are creating the whole ecosystem around what is the right thing to do around best practice. Obviously standards, because we the standards banks makes a huge difference. But I think also for all the panels, for everybody joining us, all the presenters and speakers, um, really, I think Artemis has really progressed and we've seen great technology develop and also around how we do things better. And I can assure you, many of my operators, we are funding them with big, I can't say, the brand 520s because then I'm not being brand agnostic and also PBS so they are more efficient high payload less vehicles more stable safer so I think um you know we must drive that so there's a need we've seen that it's been proven how many hundreds of millions of kilometers been done with the PBS project Dr Paul 500 million kilometers done so the stats are there the evidence is there the facts have proven themselves so let's also progress what you want to do around best practice and also developing a standard so it should be part of a trh 11 permanently for avs abnormal vehicles so it's part of a standard process shouldn't just be on a whim of pbs it should be consistent it's part of a solution it's part of their revolution it's part of improvements it's part of standards let's develop that and pro process it but thank you for joining us today and my colleagues um uh, vikash and annie from, from Standard Bank and some of the customers that are here. And then also Dion and Renal and all our back office people from Standard Bank. And then also the provincial head, Glenn Gavender. He was very supportive. You know, Glenn is amazing. He's a tall guy, man of few words. So I'll say, Glenn, we want to do a presentation. He says, done. So you got to love that. We want to do a hosted class, done. So you got to appreciate that. So thank you to the province and all the team as well from Standard Bank, Jan Harry for hosting us, for being a great, um, bring everything online. Mm -hmm. so thank you so much and now we're going to do the lucky draw I know you're keen and excited for that but watch this space we're in Cape Town next 15th of March for any of those that will be in Cape Town on 15th of March at the Liberty Centre we're going to have also great exciting panel and speakers and so on so so thank you and um, wait for the lucky draw Crystal Phyllis you're going to do the lucky draw thank you thank First you time, so let's let's say goodbye to our online uh, people for attending thank you so much for joining in and we look forward to seeing you guys again. Thank you very much.